It's done. Yeah. It's done. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, good evening to you all. Uh, welcome to the Indian Arthroplasty Association webinar number six. And this being a silver jubilee year and being the pandemic year as well, we have started this series of webinars on focus topics. You'll get more about these webinars on our website, www.indianarthroplastyassociation.com. If you have any suggestions, please uh, write in this email ID, indianarthroplasty at gmail.com. I, Dr. S.S. Mohanty, being the president of this association, welcome you all. Now, this webinar is uh, focused on periprosthetic joint infection. Now, it's easy to treat any other, uh, any other surgeon's uh, infected joints, but uh, when it's own patient's infection, then it's a nightmare for you. And for that particular patient who is infected, the result is 100% failure. Hence, we have put it rightly as surgeon's nightmare and patient's plight. You are seeing live on the YouTube through this channel. We are also live on the Facebook page. Now, we have our guest faculty today, Professor Dr. Javad Parviji. He is the James Edward Professor Chair of Orthopedics at Thomas Jefferson University at Philadelphia, USA. He is the Director of Clinical Research at Rothman Orthopedic Institute as well. And as we know, Dr. Parviji needs no introduction. And anything related to infection in joint replacement, Dr. Parviji's name comes first all over the world. Is a renowned world expert in PJI, joint preservation and joint reconstruction. Published over 800 peer-reviewed scientific articles, 30 textbooks and over 200 book chapters. And as we know, he is the chairman of two international consensus meetings on musculoskeletal infections held in Philadelphia in 2013 and 2018. And he was the president of Musculoskeletal Infection Society in 2013 as well as the Eastern Orthopedic Association in 2018. We thank Dr. Javed Parviji to be here in early morning in the United States. And thank you, Javed, for coming here and joining us today in this webinar. Thank you very much, Dr. Monty. Thank you. Our uh, next guest faculty, Professor Dr. Thurston Gerke, and he's the leading chief physician of joint surgery at Helios Endoclinic Hamburg. And he's also equally you know, renowned in periprosthetic joint infection all over the world. He's the medical director of Endoclinic at Hamburg and uh, his area of specialization of aseptic and septic revision surgery of the hip and knee endoprosthesis, primary hip and knee endoprosthetics and sports medicine as well. Nearly 200 scientific articles and 30 book chapters and he's visiting professor to many, many universities, which you cannot uh, you know, list out here. Thank you, Professor Geke, joining here with us today. And in spite of your schedule and uh, in the middle of the, your work, you have joined us today in this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Now, dear friends, they're always together, be it in a meeting, talking, or listening in a meeting, or sitting in a park or having a cup of coffee. And we have the honor and pleasure to have both of them together today in this webinar. And uh, in addition to that, we have our own people from India, Dr. Vijay Bose and Dr. Kalai Banan from Chennai, Dr. Sanjeev Jain and Dr. Pradeep Bosle from Mumbai, Dr. Rajiv K. Sharma from Delhi and Dr. Krishna Kiran from Hyderabad they will be discussing, discussing and various aspects of infection through case presentations. And we have the pleasure of having goodwill from Dr. Rami Shuriel from Australia, Dr. Nicholas Buddhifama from Indonesia, Dr. Eric Passon from Philippines, and Dr. Tang Ha Nam An from Vietnam. They have, you know, were very extremely, you know, helpful and, and they have, uh, you know, 
dear residents and fellows are also watching this webinar thank you dear friends i being the convener the little housekeeping rules any of our you know faculty wants to speak anything you can point your fingers or else type in the chat box now without wasting any time let me request dr prabhu ji to deliver his guest lecture on about the what we decided in the consensus meeting and what is the new in the diagnosis of periprosthetic joint infection dr j parvi ji over to you thank you very much dr ranti i will bring up the and i will share my perfect I assume you can see my screen or not yet? Uh not yet, yeah. Okay. And now? Yeah. Good. Great. Good. Thank you again Dr. Monty and thank you to all our friends and it's a pleasure and honor to be part of this webinar. uh i will take 10 to 15 minutes to talk about the 2018 consensus many of you are part of this and thorsten and i are grateful to all of you for making this a success the um, mission the mission of the consensus meeting was to bring together expert doctors and scientists from around the world to determine the state of the art related to orthopedic infections and then with the intention of improving the musculoskeletal care for our patients in particular by preventing the infection from happening you may ask why would you bother having consensus meeting uh, at the moment the reason is because first of all the literature is not definitive on many issues as we all know and much of the things we do today is really based on thin science if any science at all and then there is challenges for creating evidence in the field of musculoskeletal infection to do studies we require very large sample sizes which makes them uh, logistically prohibitive and obviously it would take a very very long time the other reason is that not everything we need to do need to be based on randomized prospective studies many of the things that we do today is not based on randomized prospective studies for example hand washing was an observation that uh, uh by dr semelweis wearing gloves during surgery was another one of those observations in fact discovery of penicillin was in itself an observation other reason is there is such a state of ethical uh, issue called equipoise if you believe something is right uh, then randomizing your patient to something other than that particular procedure may not be ethically right for you so if you really believe one stage exchange is the right operation randomizing them to two stage exchange perhaps uh, meets the issue of equipoise that's why thorsten and i put together this second international consensus meeting in 2018 this time we had more people uh, more societies represented almost 900 delegates from almost 100 countries and societies and the process that we followed in 2018 was exactly the same as 2013 we used the delphi method the actual process of consensus had started back in august of 2016 and it took us 2 years to go through all these various steps involved in the delphi process this slide highlights all the delphi process that we had to uh uh pass and um it was a long journey before we got to the final document i won't bore you with the details but basically we had to go through all the publications related to orthopedic infections and as you know this time we also had uh, arthroplasty and other subspecialties in orthopedics covered and uh, we had to have the document created then we had a face to face meeting and even during the meeting we had to change quite a few things there were huge debates quite a lot of things that was going on and eventually we had to put these recommendations to a vote by delegates using the um, uh, audio response uh, system 
these are the number of questions in each subspecialty that we covered. And as you can see, the, uh, all the subspecialties with the exception of hand were also discussed and covered during the second international consensus. What did we accomplish? The whole document is obviously on the website and also on the app. I hope you all have access to it. I will give you the information shortly, but let me, um, uh, give you some brief examples of what we accomplished. I think you can divide the questions, and this is what we did on the day as well, into four different categories. They are clinically important with high degree of evidence. They are clinically important with low degree of evidence. They are clinically less important with high evidence, clinically less important with low evidence. So example of a clinically important high evidence is the definition. What is the definition of PJI and what criteria can be used for diagnosis of periprosthetic joint infection. This is an area where there is uh, meta-analyses and other types of studies have been published in the past. And as you know, the international consensus definition now is based on the scoring system and not the criteria that we had in the past with each minor criterion getting a specific score based on pretest probability and also their performance. So here you'll see the serum C-reactive protein or D-dimer gets two points. Elevated ESR gets only one point. And I think there's plenty of evidence to show that ESR is not as significant as CRP. In fact, most European centers, including Thorsten, they most of the time don't do ESR. Elevated white cell count is the same when? as elevated leukocytes is the Sorry. same as elevated alpha defense. Any of these tests it's would get three it's scores. It's now, if the, the synovial blood cell count is elevated and alpha defense is positive, that's the still three points, not six, because it's or, not, and. And then the rest of them are here. It was discussed extensively. There was quite a bit of debate. And as you know, most of you were there. It only reached 68% agreement, mostly with the Europeans being worried that this definition may miss a lot of uh, uh, so-called slow-growing organisms, etc. But actually, the fact is that uh, uh, this is much less likely than the MSIS criteria to miss some of those uh, clinically silent infections. And then we, of course, talked about the algorithm. This is the algorithm for diagnosis of infection. So if you look at this algorithm, this is based on the American Academy, and I may take one minute just to sort of highlight the important areas. It is based on three things. One is uh, it's, uh, serology, two is aspiration, and three is intraoperative findings. So you would do ESR and CRP, maybe D-dimer, if you're a believer in it, maybe fibrinogen, whatever it is. And then if they are elevated, uh, or if they are normal and you have a very high index of suspicion for infection, then you would move to the next step. The next step would be aspiration of the joint. Again, the second step in diagnosis of infection is aspiration of the joint. Not CT scan, not bone scan, not PET scan. So you would aspirate the joint. You would send it for synovial white blood cell count. You would send it for culture you would send it for synovial PMM percentage. Some of us may also do leukocyte esterase test. Some of us may also send it for alpha defensive. Again, international consensus is not mandating that you perform a biomarker test on the synovial fluid. It's telling you that it would provide additional information if you wish, but in terms of the scoring system, it doesn't make a difference. When the alpha defense is positive, white cell count is elevated, they are, or you only get three points. Again, just repeating this important point because I think that was misinterpreted by some of the delegates who were attending the meeting. So if the aspiration is negative, uh, in other words, you cannot get any fluid, you have two options. One is to bring the patient back on a different date and try uh, re-aspirating or you can move on to arthroscopic or open biopsy of the joint to get fluid and or tissue, your choice. If you don't want to do surgery, 
um, then you could potentially consider other types of investigation. Now, if the synovial uh, aspiration is negative, but you have a high index of suspicion for infection, you may not re-aspirate the patient, but uh, delay, uh, uh, do the aspiration during the surgical procedure. So again, serology, aspiration, aspiration is negative, re-aspirate, or you can take the patient and do an open biopsy. So nowhere in this algorithm do you see the CT scan, PET scan, or more importantly, bone scan, anywhere in the top category for diagnosis. And it's a shame because we actually see a lot of people, uh, surgeons around my neighborhood, that will order a three-phase uh, or leukocyte-labeled bone scan, and they haven't aspirated the joint. And that is really not the way to approach this. Now, there is, um, uh, there is a, a PGI DX app, which is actually housed inside the ICM Philly app. And this app will take you through the algorithm. And I think it's very important because it will tell you what to do next uh, based on the results that uh, you provide. Another question that we'd ask is what modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors exist? Again, quite a bit of publications related to this particular issue. And modifiable risk factors include uh, high BMI, smoking, alcohol consumption, diabetes, malnutrition, and other medical comorbidities. And again, here, very high uh, agreement, 98%. Uh, venous thromboembolism was discussed, and I know I've been to India, we've talked about this a few times, and I'm delighted to see that India is also moving in the right direction by moving away from aggressive anticoagulation and using less uh, aggressive anticoagulation such as aspirin. Uh, here we asked whether there is a direct correlation between the type of VTE prophylaxis you use and the subsequent risk of SSI and PJI. Quite a lot of studies done, including two randomized prospective studies. And the answer is yes. In a majority of these studies, it is shown that the more potent or more aggressive the anticoagulation agent is, the more likelihood is uh, for, an, uh, for an SSI or PJI. Is there a, a correlation between transfusion with allogeneic blood and subsequent risk of, risk of infection? The answer is yes. Allogeneic blood transfusion does increase the risk of SSI and PJI. Hence the need for blood conservation, addressing anemia before surgery, et cetera. Another category, again, another set of important um, uh, clinical questions. Is one dose of preoperative antibiotic adequate for patients undergoing total joint arthroplasty? As you know, recently WHO and CDC are both recommending a single dose of antibiotics for clean surgical procedures, which actually includes uh, joint arthroplasty. And the recommendation was despite the current guidelines from CDC, we don't believe there is adequate evidence to stop giving our patients 24 hours of antibiotics, in other words, three doses of uh, cefazolin. And um, that was, again, very high degree of agreement. I would like you to know that there is a randomized prospective study underway in the United States. We've been part of that study. It's coordinated by Duke University, and it's uh, funded by American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons. And this study will hopefully address the question for us as to whether we need one dose or 24 hours. But until such data, level one data emerges, most institutions, including mine, continue to administer 24 hours of antibiotics to our patients. What about type of anesthesia? Does that make a difference to eventual rate of infection? The answer is yes. The spinal anesthesia appears to lower the risk of SSI and PJI. Your guess is as good as mine, and there's multiple speculations, but I believe the most important is the fact that with uh, regional anesthesia, you're able to uh, do hypotensive anesthetics, potentially reducing operative time because the muscles are not as tight, and clearly reducing blood loss, which are both linked to a subsequent risk of SSI and PJI. Laminar flow. I know this is a question that all of us keep asking on a daily basis. What type of operating room do we need to be in 
when we are performing arthroplasty. Is there a link between the use of laminar flow and subsequent infection? Not much studies. There's few from, uh, as you know, registries, including the uh, New Zealand registry that show the higher incidence of infection and laminar flow rooms, especially for hips. But here, um, I think the, uh, the understanding and the recommendation is that although you do not need to have a laminar flow room to do the arthroplasty, you need to have a room that has positive ventilation system and provides as, as much of clean air as possible. That's basically the recommendation of consensus. Uh, how about the use of antibiotic loaded cement during the primary joint replacements? No uh, proper randomized prospective study. One Canadian study was underpowered that showed no difference. There has been a lot of debate on this particular, uh, <clears throat> particular issue. In fact, we had to change the question because the initial question that we put in uh, was not uh, passed. And the, the bottom line is there is really no high level evidence to support the use of antibiotic impregnated cement during primary total joint arthroplasty, but you may want to consider that uh, for, uh, joint, uh, for um, high risk patients. So this was, the initial recommendation, there's no conclusive evidence to demonstrate that routine use of antibiotic impregnated cement in total joint arthroplasty reduces the risk of subsequent SSI and PJI. Recent high level evidence and registry data has not demonstrated demonstrate the reduction in SSI PJI. This is talking about the Australian registry. So this was actually discussed. This was the voting. And obviously, this question still remains unanswered with this type of a voting. So we had to go back and uh, choose the, uh, change the question and the answer. Is there a role for the use of antibiotic and pregnant cement during total joint, primary joint arthroplasty? And this was the recommendation. Antibiotic and pregnant cement may be used during total joint arthroplasty to reduce the risk of infection. The benefits of uh, antibiotic and pregnant cement versus cost and potential for adverse effects may be justified in high-risk uh, patients. And here we had 93% agreement. There were other questions uh, that are maybe not as clinically important, but nonetheless, something that we uh, continuously ask. Should you be changing the drapes during ir uh, irrigation debridement? I went to see Thorsten Gerke in, um, in the clinic, and I noticed that during their one stage exchanges, they would take everything out, they would rescrub new instruments, etc. And that's how I'm doing the one stage exchanges now. The question was, does that also apply for irrigation and debridement? Once you've done your irrigation debridement, should you be changing the drapes? Again, not many study on this point, and basically consensus says it hasn't been investigated, this issue has not been investigated, it should be done at the discretion of the surgeon, 94% agreement. What about number of individuals in the operating room? Does that influence the risk of subsequent infection? The answer is yes, absolutely. The number of individuals in the operating room during joint arthroplasty is directly correlated with the number of airborne particles in the OR, and hence it can lead to increase in infection, 98% agreement. And finally, maybe clinically less important question with low evidence, should surgeons uh, and OR personnel wear a mask and a cap in the operating room? I know that, remember this question was asked before the pandemic issue. There's been some studies showing that uh, uh, masks, even the surgical mask, and they don't have to be respirator masks, reduce the number of droplets and hence may be important for transmission of COVID-19. But the question is, should the masks, uh, do the masks reduce the incidence of bacterial infection a long answer here, but the bottom line is, even though this question and uh, this particular issue has not been investigated by level one studies, under the circumstances, it is advisable that the surgeon uh, wears a mask and obviously a surgical, surgical hat, 98% agreement. Uh, other questions like, what is the definition of sinus tract? It's interesting, everybody has a different definition of sinus tract. And especially because sinus tract is used as a major criterion for diagnosis of periprosthetic joint infection, we all need to understand what we mean by sinus tract. 
And I've heard a lot of people uh, refer to this as fistula. Fistula is an abnormal communication between two epithelial services. Sinus tract is a communication between a cavity and then epithelial surface, usually outside in the skin. So basically it means there's a direct track from skin all the way into the joint. If there is not such a communication, then it cannot be by definition called a sinus tract. 97% agreement. The document has been published. Uh, the, uh, the arthroplasty related uh, questions have been published in the Journal of Arthroplasty, thanks to the editor in chief, Dr. John Callahan, who facilitated that potential uh, publication. The uh, publication is also in, in the form of a book that's been translated to numerous languages and it's been distributed across many, many meetings. These are the languages so far that have been translated in uh, Korean, and they are all on the uh, website. Uh, we have disseminated the material, but most importantly, I think the material is available on ICM Philly app. And here, if I may show you, that's the PGI diagnosis app that's inside the um, ICM Philly app. In the middle, there is another app called PGI Risk Calculator, which actually tells you the, the potential risk of infection for your patient. So uh, very useful. And then very recently, last week, we added another app to this. It's the DARE Calculator. If you put in the information related to your patient with acute periprosthetic joint infection, it will tell you the likelihood of failure of the procedure uh, uh, if you were to do irrigation and debridement. Very useful. It was the winner of the Hip Society Award this year, a multi-center, multinational study that was just recently completed. And uh, I personally find, find that app very, very useful. I hope if you don't have access to ICM Philly, please download the app and um, Everything relevant related to our mission is in there and we continuously update it. Every week there is a paper of the week that we also, uh, um, we also uh, put on the website and uh, documents such as the one that we worked uh, on recently with Thorston on elective um, surgery during COVID, for example, is there also. Uh, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to present to you this material and I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Parviji. That was a great uh, uh, lecture on the recent uh, recommendations in 2018 meeting. Uh, we'll invite questions a uh, little later after uh, Professor uh, Gerke's talk. May I invite now Professor Thurston Gerke to uh, deliver his lecture on uh, one stage uh, revision. Is it the new gold standard? Hopefully. So can you hear me now? Yes, please. Okay. So again, thank you very much for this very, very kind invitation. Uh, uh, I'd like. I you know, usually I prefer to come to Indian in person, but uh, now I'm sitting here in my office. It's uh, two o'clock in the afternoon, and um, but I'm very glad to see you all and uh, to get the opportunity to talk a little about about one stage. I did many talks about one stage during the last twenty twenty five years, but I want. I'd like to show you some new results about uh, one stage, new papers, new publications. And probably, I know it's a little bit provocative, uh, the new gold standard, but uh, at the end of this talk, probably you will see that this is not too provocative at the moment. So Jay did a very nice talk about uh, how can I proceed here? You can click on the lower left corner of your slide. Ah, okay. Uh, so as you all know, and as you have heard from uh, Jay, uh, 
uh, already the worst complication in total joint arthroplasty is PGR, which is really a life-threatening complication. PGI is worse than some cancers, worse than uh, breast cancer, melanoma, Hodgkin's lymphoma, or testis uh, cancer. So it's really a very, very severe complication. And we have heard a lot about diagnosis yet, about uh, um, environment, how to treat it. And I'd like to talk now uh, about treatment. As we all know, we have many, many options to treat the periprostatic infections. Uh, um, some of them are very, very um, favorable, but and some of them not like the resection arthroplasty, amputation, or um, lifetime antibiotic suppression. So the godfather of the endo clinic was this man, Professor Buchholz, who um, did the first total hip replacement in Germany f uh, 56 years ago. Here you can see the x-ray. And he was a genius guy. He uh, did a lot of joint replacement already in the 60s. Uh, his main problem, as you can imagine, uh, was the periprosthetic joint infection, of course, where he reached in the peak more than 6%. Uh, so he was thinking about this issue and he came to the idea, and this is a letter that he wrote uh, 51 years ago in 1969 to the company Kulzer, who manufactured the bone cement during this time. And he asked the company, is it possible to add mix antibiotics to the bone cement? And they agreed, they did some work with him, uh, they um, developed bone cement, which uh, included first penicillin and then erythromycin, and then they ended up with gentamicin. And on the right side, you can see how he reduces, he reduced his infection rate at the beginning of the 70s, almost down to 0.5. The goal was to not to kill the bacteria in the situs. The goal is mainly of antibiotic loaded bone cement to protect the new implant from recolonization of bacteria. So in, in the endoclinic, uh, since that time, we developed the concept of the one stage exchange. Buchholz did it, started with the one stage exchange 50 years ago, and in the meantime, we do about 84%, 85% of all our infections in the one-stage procedure, and only less than 10% in the two-stage procedure. So our protocol is, if we have a very early infection, an immediate infection, a direct post-op infection, which means uh, it occurs less than three weeks, after implantation and where the biofilm is really very, very vulnerable. In this early biofilm, you can disrupt uh, and you have a chance to perform some kind of DARE. DARE is a very new term. 20, 30 years ago, we did exactly the same uh, as it described in the English literature, but we call it uh, I, deep, irrigation and debridement, and of course, additionally, systemic antibiotics. We are very, very strict in our protocols. So every infection, periprosthetic infection that occurs longer than three weeks uh, after implantation of the implant, we go for an exchange, for a septic exchange. Uh, this is uh, in a clear contradiction to the philosophy of many, many other groups all over the world, mainly in the UK, who are talking about there a lot at the moment, and especially the Oxford data show that there could be done even in a long term and after one or two or three years with quite good results. But they say, they also say, as earlier you do the dare, as better are the results. Unfortunately, all over the world, we see cases like this, this young lady who 
um, uh, underwent 87 revisions without removal of the implant. And she was suffering for periprosthetic joint infection for more than six years. Or the surgeon is not able to remove the implant, as you can see here, case from Italy where the surgeon was not able to remove the distal uh, cement glass revision stem and he put on a spacer like this. Uh, he was not really radical. He didn't really exchange uh, the procedures. He didn't really remove the foreign material. So I was forced to do it in that way. So uh, mainly uh, Jay Pavisi and Samar's uh, um, uh, published data about um, the control rate of late you know, chronic infections by retention of the implant by not removing all the um, foreign material. And you can see here the results by doing this uh, the literature are very, very poor, 18 to 36 percent. So the question now is, should we go for the one stage or better for a two stage? It's one method, but it's probably a little bit safer than the other method. Uh, all over the world, the two stage exchange is still the golden standard. Nobody knows really what a golden standard is, but everybody ta is talking about it. But the whole world, or most uh, parts of the world, are doing the two stage revision. But I put a big question mark behind it. Now, there are many pros and cons between one stage and two stage. In my opinion, two stage has much, much more pros than cons. Uh, surgical risk is lower, functional impairment is lower, financial burden is much lower, compliance and satisfaction rate of the patient rate is very high. Our therapy algorithm in the endoclinic is quite clear. So, First of all, is there a major biofilm? Um, if, if you say yes, then you see the pathogen is known and local antibiotics are possible and a radical debridement is possible, we go for the one stage. If we have a no uh, uh, in this algorithm, we uh, uh, go for another kind of therapy there or two stage exchange. Our key of success in a one stage is, and this is the yeah, prerequisite for a one stage, you have to do a very, very probably preoperative diagnosing, and you have to know which germs are responsible for the PGI. If you know the germ, and if you know the susceptibility of the germ, in our opinion, you can go for the one-stage exchange. If you do not know the germ, you should pr perform a two-stage. Here are the key steps of a one-stage exchange. We excise the old scar. We do it in a very well-structured manner, the debridement, radical sin sinovectomy, of course. Remove again, remove all foreign material. Perform a radical debridement of the bone. Uh, use uh, pulsatile jet lavage and in our opinion and this is changing a little bit during the last years in our opinion you should use antibiotic loaded bone cement here's our protocol the patient is coming to the admission two days before the surgery because many of those patients are multi-morbid so they need another day for preparation from the internal medicine, from anesthetists and so on. And then we do the uh, one stage exchange on the third day. The um, dismission is uh, 14 days, in average 14 days later. After 10 to 12 days, we stop the systemic antibiotic therapy and remove the suture. Here, a short video how we are doing it in the hips. So you have to remove, again, you have to remove uh, all foreign material. We um, prefer to remove the stems in the endofemoral way. We don't like the ETO very much um, because the integrity in, uh, of the uh, bone, in our opinion, is uh, 
mandatory. After removal of the last uh, biopsy, we start with systemic uh, uh, antibiotics. And as you, uh, Jay already mentioned, we change after debridement everything. We change the gloves, all our gowns, everything, and the instruments. And then we are going for reimplantation of a new device with antibiotic loaded bone cement. And that's all. I show it shortly in a knee. It's, it's the same philosophy. First of all, radical debridement in a standardized manner. So we start anterior, then medial, then lateral. Remove all foreign material, even little cement pieces. Remove the tibial tray, of course. And if there are some crew screws or uh, circlages or something like this, they have to remove it as well. Clean it, clean it, clean it. Debridement, debridement, debridement. Uh, debride also the posterior capsule, capsule very thoroughly. Start with a systemic embryo to change everything and then re-implantation of a new device. And we are with antibiotic loaded bone cement. And this is probably no, a little bit too much, but we believe in hinge uh, implants, and so we are using in our one stages of the knees always a rotating hinge knee. So one stage means radical debridement, usage of pulsatile lavage, and a very very good and uh, microbiological advice because you have to tailor the antibiotic mixture in the bone cement to the germ and to the susceptibility of the germ. So that means uh, you cannot use always the same antibiotics in the bone cement. You have to tailor it on the susceptibility. So, and you need a multidisciplinary approach. This is a top secret. This is really the secret after the uh, behind the success of a one stage. You need a good microbiologic lab. You need a good cooperation with the microbiologists or infectologists. You need a very good nurse team. You need a good anesthesiological team. And you need, of course, skilled and trained surgeon. And this is probably the most important uh, uh, point because uh, you need training in doing septic revisions. We have some indications for two-stage septic revisions. Of course, if we do not identify the germs preoperative, if there are no local antibiotics uh, available, if the radical debridement is not possible, then we go for a two-stage. I'd like to show you shortly how we are doing the two-stage at the moment since three years now. And I love this concept because it's a very safe concept. We all know that um, spacers, any kind of spacers, usually in the two-stage exchange could lead to dramatic complications, fractures, dislocations, and so on and so on. And uh, here uh, is a girdle stone after removal. Here is another removal. And you see here there's a huge, if you do, do it in that way, with a girdle stone a situation, could develop a massive um, a bone around the joint, and then you have to, um, to change it. Um, here is a typical example, infected cementless uh, joint replacement, hip arthroplasty. Uh, the germ was not identified, and we do our two-stage procedure uh, in, a, I would say, I would say it's a 1.5 stage exchange. We do our spacers in the, with a combination of a badly cemented stem with a dual mobility inlay. The, it, just the inlay uh, of the dual mobility cup. I show it in this video shortly to you. So, First of all, you put in the antibiotic loaded bone cement in the acetabulum. During um, hardening of the bone cement, during uh, polymerization of the bone cement, you move the trial of the uh, dual mobility inlay liner, uh, that's the trial, until the cement is really hard. 
So you create an antibiotic loaded bone cement shell in your acetabulum, as you can see here. And then you put in just the, the liner. You would cement the stem in a very bad, very late, bad cementing technique, quite late, not after two minutes, after four to five minutes, then you put in a, a liner on it. And this is a very safe procedure. And we did, at the moment, we did 75 uh, uh, of these spacers without any, any kind of complications. The patient can uh, have full weight bearing uh, from the first day. We haven't seen any dislocations, this spacer dislocations or anything else. So, but let's go back um, uh, to the, to the one-stage versus two-stage um, um, procedure. Uh, if you uh, look at uh, to UK, we must say that there is an increased use of single-stage revision in UK. In 2005, just 17% of the surgeons were using the single-stage revision. In 2014, they were already using almost 40%, and now it's almost 50%. Because the morbidity in the two-stage approach is quite high. The 90-day morbid mortality rate is about 2.6%, and major complications were seen in more than 15%. The complication rates of a two-stage exchange are significantly greater than some very, very big surgeries. That's a paper that was a paper of the week and uh, one year ago, the ICM paper of the week. It's coming from uh, Michigan, from a US where almost everybody is performing the two stage except, except Jay, fortunately. And they, they um, concluded in this paper, they compared um, all the, the, the management, the life quality in one stage and two stage, and they, com they concluded that the one stage revision produced greater health utility. Also, and that's very important, also in difficult to treat organisms, including MRSA. And additionally, it's a very cost saving. In the consensus, you have heard a lot about it. I don't know, I don't want to reply it. We said that the one stage procedure remains a viable option for the management uh, of chronic prosthetic joint in, uh, infections, except in patients with side of systemic sepsis, extensive comorbidities, and with resistant organisms or culture negative. So the multidisciplinary approach is very, very, very important. You have to look at the patient, of course, first. Uh, and if you see the patient-related risk factors um, for periprosthetic joint infection, in the, these are data from UK on 512,000 patients. Uh, there are the main risk factors where BMI over 40, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, depression, steroids, and, and, and that's very important, previ previous joint surgeries. So I'm not going, uh, I'm uh, skipping this. Against and the multidisciplinary team, the cooperation of all the involved um, subgroups is very important. Knowledge of the germ is important. You need a very, very good infrastructure. And that's a great paper from uh, Haddad School where he described this multidisciplinary team. So, Another point is I sent, uh, mentioned it's skilled and trained surgeons. Of course, the surgeons is very important. The surgeon must be able to perform a radical debridement. What is radical? I mean, really, that's the most uh, difficult part of the surgery to decide is this, uh, is this tissue infected or not. You have always to find the interface to the healthy issue. Radical means really radical. If it is, uh, the whole bone is infected, you have to remove the whole bone. So primary fixation is important, of course. If we are going to the literature now, what are the most, more recent ones? Let, we published a lot about this, about uh, blood loss. Blood loss was a cooperation with Jay's group in Rossman. 
blood loss is much, much less in the one stage group compared to the two stage group. Of course, um, then we uh, uh, looked after the in hospital complications after one stage and two stage. Uh, and you can see here that the surgical morbidity was almost the same, but the medical morbidity uh, and mortality it was much, much higher in the two stage. You see our mortality uh, uh, rate was 2.27% and for the one stage only 05 Okay, this is a very biased study, but it's interesting. What's about our long-term results, 10-year results of, in our hands of the one stage exchange is about 94% after 10 years, but you have to um, uh, notice that the revision-free survival is just, just 76%. So we looked after the predictors of failure of uh, at the two stage, is that's clear. There, Jay's group published med, uh, medicine-resistant organisms, culture-negative organisms, and increased reimplantation operative time as the main risk factors for failure. And then we asked ourselves, why do one stages fail? We published it in uh, GVGS and clinical orthopedics, uh, two publications. We looked after almost 701 stages in TKA. Uh, I make a long story short. Uh, the most um, failures happened um, after between one, uh, six months and uh, two years. Here are the top three causes for failure. Recurrence of infection, sept aseptic load loosening, and patella problems. But why did they fail? Here I show you enterococci are very, very highly uh, for failure prior one stage or more than four surgeries before. And interestingly, uh, isolation of streptococcus is also a main reason for failure. So uh, this is according to another paper from Ma, who described as well enterococcus species as a very, very difficult to treat uh, germ, gout, surgery, and BMI here. And here are some others who describe streptococci as well as so the last publications, I go very, very uh, quickly through it. We published our results, 10 to 14 year results in patients younger than 45 years uh, in, uh, um, in hip arthroplasty. And uh, the average duration rate was six, 96%, but the overall survival rate again was just 77%. In the knees, uh, here the paper from France, uh, a reintegration rate in comparison is one stage much, much better than in the two stage. This effort group um, concluded the similar results in terms of eradication rates and offering the advantage of a unique surgical procedure, lower morbidity and reduced costs. Uh, here, another paper from Denmark, um, which uh, concluded uh, that the patients treated with cementless one stage revision has a very marked increase in uh, uh, life quality terms. And I could go through the whole literature here from the Auto Carolina group in US who mentioned that one stage is a wonderful procedure, but not very cost effective for the surgeons. Uh, here, another paper from Norway, um, one stage, again, two stage, much better results for the one stage group in the registry. Uh, another paper from uh, France, 90% remission, uh, remission rate, uh, better than the two stage. And I could go through all these literatures and papers, and most of them, uh, are coming to the conclusion, as you can see here, for example, and from this, uh, again, from France, one stage exchange seemed to provide better results with less reinfection and fewer complications than two stage. So I ask you again, is the two stage really still the golden standard? I'm not sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gerke. That was an excellent uh, exposition of one stage revision. 
uh, now we have plethora of questions from our you know uh, people here but uh, before we start uh, uh, let me ask one question uh, to uh, dr parviji now you know metal on metal uh, hips and uh, reaction metal on metal in a local tissue reaction mimics uh, infection in a joint replacement the question is you know how do you differentiate uh, this um, adverse tissue reaction and infection in a case uh, who has undergone metal on metal pre operatively as well as intra operatively yeah, thank you dr mahanti yeah, very challenging situation preoperatively your workup for infection is no different for metal on metal than regular uh, hips with one or two small exceptions. So you would still do ESR and CRP. And if you have a high index of suspicion or if ESR and CRP is abnormal, you would aspirate the joint. Now with metal and metal, when there's adverse local tissue reaction, there's usually quite a bit of fluid either in the joint or adjacent to the abductor mechanism where the destructive process is taking place. So you, usually these hips are either aspirated under uh, ultrasound or a Mars type MRI is done on the metal on metal type. So either way, you would then aspirate that joint. You would send it for culture for sure. You would then send it for biomarkers if you wish, but uh, cell count and neutrophil differential. There has been some suggestions that you should perform a manual cell count on this fluid because the automated process may pick up the iron metal particles as a cell and give you a false result. That doesn't actually seem to bear weight based on two recent studies. Either way, whether you want to do manual or automated, you should definitely analyze the cells. The threshold for cell count and neutrophil differential for an ALTR situation is considered to be the same as other uh, scenarios for infection until maybe further evidence emerges in the future, in which case we'll re-examine that, that threshold. So the one uh, very important issue that uh, exists is that if you're operating on an ALTR situation, and as most of us have done, the fluid is very purulent, is suggestive of infection. And that can sometimes mislead us in the process to think that it's infected when it may not be. But the flip side of the coin is that the incidence of infection in ALTR cases is much higher. It's about eight to 9% based on some literature recently, and even in some series up to 30%. So just because you identify ALTR, it doesn't mean you've ruled out infection. And remember that ALTR can look like infection and it may not be. So it's sort of very complex process. To give you a very quick answer, what do I do? ESR, CRP, I aspirate them regardless. I actually get an MRI to see if there's destructive process around the uh, abductors or not. If there's destructive process, if I'm worried about the type of metal uh, uh, components that are in there, I would revise them anyway. And then at the time of surgery, I would send a sample for cell count, neutrophil differential. I do leukocyte esterase. We published on this, leukocyte esterase has about 92% sensitivity for picking up infection in the presence of ALTR. I would send it for culture. If I'm worried, I would remove everything, put a spacer, wait for the culture, and go back early and put them in. But if I think that we've ruled out infection, I would then remove everything and um, redo them at the same time. I know this is a long-winded way, but to summarize, you should work up all ALTR cases for infection because the incidence of infection is very high in these patients. Seeing pus during surgery doesn't necessarily mean they are infected because ALTR can lead to a destructive process that makes it look like pus. What about leukocyte esterase and uh, alpha defensin in? Uh... Leukocyte esterase, alpha defensin is not proven to have a role in diagnosis of ALTR. 
that's one exception to the ALTR. I know Thorsten has some experience with the new tests. I don't know if the lateral flow test is, has been validated for this particular application, but with Cleveland Clinic, we wrote up our results with Luxad estrays for ALTR, and it has 92% sensitivity. So I would do Luxad estrays. Uh, I, yeah. Can I can I add something? Yes, please. Uh, so I uh, sign everything of what Jay already said um, regarding metallosis. Um, alpha deficiency uh, could be very misleading because uh, if you have some kind of metallosis or metalware, uh, not uh, even if it is not ALTR you could have an increased alpha defensive value. So for example, today I operated a dislocated uh, acetabular component, which dislocated up to the iliac crest. Uh, and with a lot of metallosis, the patient had a alpha defensive of 3.5. The cutoff is 1.0. So I re-punctured uh, her last night again, because I was not sure. Everything was normal. It was uh, clear fluid. Leukocyte esterase was negative. Uh, cell count was negative, and PMN was negative. So only the alpha difference was higher. So um, don't be misleaded by um, false positive alpha difference It's in some cases not an infection. It's a some kind of metalware. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more question uh, that um, when you add uh, antibiotics to the cement, uh, do you add antibiotic powder to the cement powder first, uh, then mix it thoroughly, then you add the liquid? But some people tell that uh, you first, uh, you know, add the liquid to the cement powder and while the cement polymerase then gradually add antibiotic powder so that the antibiotic properties are not affected. Uh, so, yeah, very good question. Thank you so much for it. Um, uh, we call it pharmaceutical mixing. That means we have the powder and we put a little amount of antibiotics into the powder, mix it, then another little amount of antibiotics, powder to powder, mix it, mix it, in small doses, step by step. So you get a more homogeneous distribution of the antibiotics in the bone cement powder. And if you are, when you finished with your at mixing, then you put the fluid on it. And that's the way. Uh, is there any question from the faculty or else I'll go to the questions from, from our faculty? Uh, I have a question. Yes, uh, yes. To Thorsten, but Thorsten has just left. Yeah. Maybe Rajiv, uh, your question is to whom? Uh, my question to Jay is or? to Thorsten. Uh, okay. Oh, you just, oh, sorry, you sorry, just, sorry, I'm here. I'm here, but they had a right. kind of an emergency. So, uh, three times. Uh, Thorsten, I have a question for you. Yeah. And uh, Jay can also add on. You know, when we do the uh, femoral revisions in PHR, you know, one stage is fine. But when you do a cemented revision, when there is uh, not a good uh, cancellous bone for you to cement, I mean, there's so many published reports saying that they do very badly, but only in the endoclinic, we're able to cement in a very, you know, bad uh, cancellous bed and all that, caught in the bone and they're able to get away with it. So what's your uh, thoughts on that? Yeah. Uh, very good question, Vijay, because um, this is, you, you, you pointed exactly the weak weak point out because uh, that's a weak point in one stage exchange or in hips. As you said, after removal um, of the former prosthesis, your bone bed, your cancellous bone bed is really poor. So you re-cement in a poor bone bed and this could lead to um, very, very short uh, survival of the stem, as you said. Um, we, we do it and we, we published our data. So we have after 10 years, a loosening rate of about 10%, 10 to 12%. But um, this could be a very good argument first for a two stage in the hips, because 
you can re-implant a cementless revision stem. You have the chance to re-cement in the second stage a cementless revision stem. Or we see more and more publications. I showed one of them uh, from Denmark, where they use cementless stems and partially cups in one stage exchange. I think it's quite brave, but they report very good results. There is another group who is doing it in Vienna. There is another group uh, who is doing it um, in Norway. Um, so uh, I think uh, um, it's you, you said that's a weak point. I think we should use, we still use antibiotic loaded bone cement. Uh, Jay, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, Vijay, thank you for that question. Um, I agree with Thorsten. But you know, in the US, all the revision hips are uncemented, and majority of revision knees are cemented. So if we're doing one stage, uh, which I have done, which means I had the same amount of antibiotics that the endoclinic protocol uh, asks for. But in the hips, we do not do cementing. We have been doing uncemented hips. We have a, I mean, Tom Faring is doing that one stage versus two stage randomized prospective study. The results will be out soon. But uh, cementing the hips was not part of that protocol. Not because we're disrespecting what endoclinic has been teaching us, but for surgeons who haven't been doing cemented revision hips, for them suddenly to start doing cemented because of that uh, antibiotic delivery issue, we were worried that we were going to get terrible results. So we have continued. And I guess we will see whether the hips have a higher failure after one stage when cement antibiotic cement was not used versus the knees when it was used thanks thanks very much thanks pj yeah rajiv uh, thank you Shubranshu. Uh, my question is to both uh, jawad and uh, thorsten uh, Thorsten, you you showed us very well very good uh, presentation of your uh, uh, one stage revision uh, what we what we understand is that you are using in most cases the rotating hinge. What is the extent of your uh, because one stage is uh, how much uh, debrima how how much of the tissues dirty tissues you remove or do you take off the whole uh, medial collateral and lateral collateral significant part of it? Is that the reason of your success? I mean most in most of our hands. If one stage revision is not as successful because probably we try to uh, retain some of the uh, doubtful tissues. Thank you so much, Rajiv, for this very important question. Uh, so first of all, I think and uh, the secret of our success is the radicality of debridement, as you said. So when we have uh, visiting doctors here or fellows from other parts of the world, they were also always completely surprised how radical we are. Um, and this, that's the reason, uh, probably sometimes we are a little bit too radical, could be, but that's the reason why we have to use hinge knees because we, it, uh, involve in our debridement usually the medial ligaments. So uh, um, this, that's the main reason why we do it. So uh, it, it, most of the infections, I would say in 80-85% of the infections, the collateral ligaments are involved in the infection. Um, of course there are amount of let's say 10 to 20 percent where, where we have a very low grade infection where you could use another kind of implant, implant like a PS design or a CCK design of course but uh, we have our protocols and we have I believe in standards to be honest and that's our standard to use the rotating engine. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah Avina we have uh, questions from YouTube. Unmute yourself, please. 
Uh, yes, sir. We've got a question for Dr. Thurston uh, from YouTube, sir. Uh, Dr. Kushmukhi asks, how many one stages do you accept in a patient? Uh, and what is your indication for a uh, suppose you have one stage failure, uh, one stage has a failure, and when do you turn over to a two stage? Good question. Practically, we do usually not more than two one stages. So if we have a failure of one one stage, many times we repeat it another one stage. But if we have two failed one stages, we remove everything and wait to perform a two stage. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Before next question, Krishna, yes, your question. You had a question. Unmute yourself, please. Yeah. So my question is to Thorsten. Uh, uh, you showed that there is a nine to ten percent failure of your one-stage uh, knee revisions. So what happens to them? You have put in a, a cemented hinge prosthesis. So what is the next stage for them? So how many of them actually end up with a further revision or? Uh, what is the option in them? That's almost the same answer. So one failed, um, if you have quite good bone and soft tissue, uh, one, after one failed one stage, we do another one, fa uh, one stage, usually. Um, if we have uh, a, a big amount of bone loss, if the soft tissue is weak, we are not going for another one stage, then we go for a two stage. And we use always, and this is also part of our philosophy, we use in a two-stage in knees always static spaces with rods, with rods in the, with the uh, rods in the tibia and in the femur. So if one stage is uh, knee failed, remove it, do another one stage if the circumstances are allowing it, if not due to bone or soft, soft tissue defect, we go for two stage. Uh, there's one question from uh, YouTube by Dr. Sam Mukhi. The patient is doing well with the spacer and then uh, she doesn't want a revision. Then how long uh, you want to pull on? <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, so there are, you have seen our spacers and you can imagine that some patients are very happy with the spacer, spacer. We had usually our interval is about two to three months. We have quite long interval between the two, one to two stages. We had one patient who due to cardiac um, uh, problems he had the spacer for one and a half year and he was absolutely happy. But interestingly, and the most interesting part is, in this kind of spacer, I expected a lot of third body wear because the, the inlay is moving in the cement shell. So we send it to the lab, we send it to the pathologist, and he couldn't find anywhere particles. That was very interesting. So usually we do it just for two to three months. You can leaves the space a longer up to one year but i do not recommend to use it as a lifetime uh, kind of arthroplasty uh, jay would you like to add um, hi okay. what about you in your practice do you um, how long do you leave these patients with spatial if they're happy about it and moving around uh, don't have pain or instability yeah uh Great question. I, I don't have a specific metric for time. It's individualized, but we do have patients who actually had an articulating spacer and who never want to come back and get reimplanted. We have them many years out. But as Thorsten said, you know, you do worry about uh, the bone loss in this, in this situation and possibility of dislocation and dislodgement of the spacers. So I start to get a little nervous if it's been there more than a year. Okay. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes, yes, please. Yeah. Uh, what is the post-op protocol of antibiotic one stage and two stage or any standard protocol? Post-op IV antibiotics. I can, I can say it for the one stage, uh, our average. So 
There is no standard post-op protocol. It depends on the patient. It depends on the germ. It depends on the susceptibility of the germ, the wound situation. But average, it's about 14 days systemic antibiotics. And then we switch to orals for another six weeks at the moment. Uh, three, four years ago, we recommended just systemic for 12 days and nothing, but we changed a little bit our mind. So 14 days systemic, six uh, weeks um, uh, orals. In the two stage, it's the same, uh, depends on the situation, uh, on the length of the interval, but we are doing two stages only in selective cases. And according to Jay's work, who did it with Craig de la Valle, um, we are um, at the moment prefer longer antibiotic therapy up to three months after two stage. Jay, what's about you? Uh, yeah. When do you decide to give six weeks of IV antibiotics? No, no. Two when do you decide IV. to give six weeks of uh, IV six. antibiotics? Yeah, but very rarely. Okay. So not required. We don't know. It's very, very rarely. I cannot really remember uh, a six-week IV procedure. We had a, we had one case with tuberculosis who received, of course, for a long time IVs, but usually not. Okay. Okay. Jay, what is your protocol? Yeah, we uh, similar. So with the two stage, we would give them four to six weeks of antibiotics. And so that can be intravenous if there is no orally available agent against that particular organism. But if there is an oral agent, then they would receive oral antibiotics. So for example, Pseudomonas, they would go on uh, fluoroquines. Some of the MSSAs may be treated by oral antibiotics when they leave the hospital. Then we would have the reimplantation after implantation, if the culture is negative, they would receive three months of oral suppressive antibiotics based on that study that Thorsten just uh, mentioned. If the culture is positive, based on a paper that we wrote and Charité Group also confirmed, the failure rate is really high in these patients, so they may benefit from an ad additional intravenous antibiotics for four weeks. At one stage, we're following the endoclinic protocol. They will receive six weeks of complete antibiotics, again, intravenous, if there is no oral agent, but oral antibiotics also. And then after the six weeks, we stop. We don't give them any further. You know, Mark Scarborough and the group from Oxford just published a very interesting paper that showed there was no difference between oral and intravenous antibiotics and treatment of these patients. Granted, it was a very heterogeneous group of patient population, but it's possible that we've been a little too aggressive with the administration of intravenous antibiotics, and time has come for us to think about at least switching them to oral after a week or so of intravenous antibiotics if an oral bioavailable antibiotic exists. Okay, Dr. Sanjeev Jain. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, what's your percentage of recurrence or reinfection rate in one stage or two stage? And do you have any very specific protocol to pick up this early infection recurrence? Jay, would you like to take that? Sure. Um, after two stage, all comers uh, within the first five years is about 24 to 25% failure. And uh, that's a great question, Dr. Jane. We'll come back to defining what we mean by failure, but let's just go through the numbers. So 25% failure within five years. One stage, I don't know, because we've only been doing them for a year and a half or so now. I think I have done about 21 so uh, cases. One has failed, um, the others haven't. So I don't know the right number for the one stage. I think I'll let Thorsten answer that question. In terms of what we define as failure, though, uh, you saw the new paper by Yale Fillingham, the MSIS criteria for definition of failure. A lot of people think that retaining an implant uh, is success. 
But if you look at those patients really critically, some of them are on chronic suppressive antibiotic treatment because there's a still an infection. And some of them have loose components, but they don't want to undergo another operation. Some of them have severe functional limitation and pain. So, you know, depending on where you draw the line in terms of defining success, I think that number gets to be higher and higher if you take into account radiographic loosening, take into account the functional outcome, and more importantly, if you take into account the mortality. So, you know, between the first and the second, as Thorsten said, seven to eight percent of our patients die between the first and the second stage. Eleven percent of our patients never come back to get the second stage, either because they're still having the anti uh, the spacer in place, they're not medically fit for another operation, or patients have just had enough and they don't want to do it. So that's really something that I think the orthopedic community needs to become a little more engaged in defining what we mean by failure and success. But if recurrence of infection means another organism or the same organism coming back, florid infection resulting in another operation, that number is more like 10 to 12%. Thank you. Okay. Uh, in continuation to that, there's a question from Dr. Suryan Narayan that suppose uh, one of the implant is well fixed in presence of infection, do you tend to take out both of them or try to retain that? Uh, what is your uh, take on that? Uh, Thurston, would, would you like to take that? Yeah, yeah, that's a very, very, <laughs> that's a question which is really under discussion at the moment. And I have always my fights at, about it, especially with the UK groups uh, from London and some other group, uh, cities there. So our clear, absolutely clear opinion is you have to remove everything, even very, very, very well fixed implants. And when you, if you are not able to remove them, you have to send them to a center who is able to remove it. Because we do think in the concept of biofilm, we do think in the concept of um, uh, colonization of foreign material, and nobody can tell me that, uh, or I can really be sure that there are no bacteria going in the interface between the fixed, well fixed procedures and the bone. So um, I know that many surgeons um, uh, don't like this philosophy uh, because of the inability to remove some kind of fixed uh, implants. Um, but I don't see any reason to leave a well-fixed implant if in case of periprosthetic joint infections, yeah. we remove everything. Yeah, Dr. Asit, sir. Yeah, uh, my question is, we do more and more joint replacements and we will get infections. As our number of primary joint replacement increases, the infections are going to go up. Do you think that this work of revision surgery, every arthroplasty surgeon should get on with it or it should be left with a particular center where more and more experience is gathered, more and more patients are referred there. So the outcome from that particular center would be very good uh, from both of you, please. My opinion, we need centers. With every country needs a center because I mentioned in my, during my talk, you need skilled and trained surgeons. So, and you, you have these kind of surgeons in regarding uh, septic revisions only in centers who are doing two, three hundred, I don't know, five hundred likely. So, and I don't understand why they do not realize it. So in Spain, they did it. In Spain, they have four centers and every infected patient has, be, has to be sent to the, one of the centers. In UK, they have the same, five centers in all UK. Um, why not in every country? I'm fighting for it here in Germany. We need just three or four in Germany. We have 80 million. It's not comparable with India, of course. 80 million people, four centers would be enough. One in the north, one in the south, west and east. And in India, the same. I mean, you have all the big cities around India 
And why not establish a center in Delhi, a center in Mumbai, a center in Hyderabad, in, I don't know, Bangalore, um, Pune, I don't know. Uh, so, because only if you establish centers, you will get satisfying results. Okay. Jay, yeah. your comments on this, please? Yes. I... I agree with uh, I agree with that comment completely with, with Thorsten. Um, you know, I'm not sure um, I'm not sure if I can add much more to what he's just said. And unfortunately, I apologize very much, but I have a very firm commitment that I have to get off in uh, next ten seconds to get on another call. I apologize. Um, there's okay. some emergency that I have to leave. Okay. Is that okay? Is that is that is that okay, Dr. Mahanti? No. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Jay. Thanks so much, Jay, for joining. Yeah, answering uh, the, all the questions, and uh, I extend my heartfelt gratitude to you for being here with us and um, giving your excellent uh, lecture and uh, thanks, answering all the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great thank seeing you, all my, my friends. Thank, thank, you, thank, you, very, thank, thank you. you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Uh, now, Thurston, uh, can you tell us, uh, you know, I know that there should be dedicated centers uh, where there will be infectious uh, disease specialists as well as a microbiologist. You should have a good lab for culture as well, for extended culture, for fungal culture, anaerobes, everything. You know. um, that's why I agree with you. There should be dedicated centers for treating infection. Otherwise, it gets neglected. Uh, now, my next question is that, uh, could you guide us uh, uh, in view of the, you know, recent pandemic that uh, what is your protocol for treating the patients uh, for joint replacement? What, what precautions are from the beginning? Uh, how do you treat these patients for the benefit of our, you know, delegates? In which city, for which situation? I didn't, I didn't okay. catch it. Uh, in COVID situation now, what in is your COVID, protocol uh, for COVID. doing a uh, joint replacement surgery? So yeah, so uh, so what we are doing is um, uh, every patient. As a, as a first out, uh, our protocol is first we call the patient one or two days by phone. Um, I can show you. Can I show you a short video? Y yes, please. If possible. Yeah, you can uh, split your screen now. Let me see, let me see. And then because I I have a video about it. So um, probably uh, I show you one paper first. Can you see my screen? Uh, not yet. Uh, not yet, wait one second, one second, one second. Uh, no. Yeah. No. Yeah. That's so, it. Uh, this is a this is a um, presentation that I uh, prepared for some other webinars. So. Um, uh, I cannot find my mouse anymore. Oh, there. So, as as uh, I show you a little bit about the situation, as you can see, in 2019 was like this, and um, every big places all over the world were crowded. The life was normal, and. Uh, life was normal and then uh, corona came and i cannot really uh, lower left hand corner your arrows i cannot find my mouse to be honest i don't know why let me see So, no, it's not working. Uh, in the lower left-hand corner, uh, yeah, it's working. Uh, okay, but there's a movie. So, we did this, uh, we did 
This is consensus uh, meeting and the new challenge, of course. Uh, that's why your, your question is absolutely okay. Uh, we did, um, uh, with the new challenge is the uh, new corona, which spread all over the world from China, as we know. Uh, yesterday, uh, on uh, today, May 29, we have about 360,000 confirmed deaths. So, and uh, week by week, there's a big change of confirmed deaths. For example, uh, here it seems that India is okay. It's about um, it's about uh, minus 10 percent every new week. Russia is on a very high, but and as I said, uh, told you before, this was the situation in 2019. That's the situation now, where we have empty places all over the world. And I would like to show you this video, but I cannot really find my mouse. Uh, I wanted to show you a video. No, but I show you our algorithm. Uh, or if you have the video separately, you can run it. Uh, yeah, I don't know why it doesn't work here in this. So, and this is a paper I like. So, we did Jay uh, and Bill Walters from Sydney and I here in Hamburg. We did an ICM about uh, resuming elective surgery in COVID, the COVID 19 area. So, Jay told you already that the ICM consensus uh, for peripatric joint infection last the two years. And this paper we did in one week, to be honest. So we defined and described the, the uh, consensus questions. Uh, we put up our work groups in Philadelphia, in Sydney, and here in Hamburg. We came to a conclusion, we came to recommendations, we sent the recommendations to 19 experts all over the world and uh, to judge about it. And then they sent it back after 36 hours. We just gave them 36 hours to, um, uh, to evaluate them. And then uh, we submitted it to the GVGS and after eight days, it was published. Uh, here you see the paper and I like to encourage everybody of you also, all everybody on um, YouTube, to read this paper because all the un unanswered questions are in there um, according to the available uh, literature. The whole document is published in Auto Evident, very good paper. And this is a typical example of the questions. The questions one was, for example, when will the SARS CoV 2 pandemic end? And our recommendation, of course, is nobody knows. It will end if we reach herd immunity, if we develop an effective vaccine, if the pathogen mutates, or we, got, we get an effective treatment. Another one, it's more about pre-admission, what additional steps should be taken during uh, the pre-admission process. So we have to um, use, of course, soap, masks, uh, social distancing, and so on and so on. Um, these are all another very important question is what kind of helmets or should a surgeon use helmets? Should standard surgical helmets and protection suits be utilized when performing elective surgery during SARS CoV 2 pandemic? And the answer was no, no helmets, please, because the fans of the helmet could be. Um, uh, could be uh, full of uh, viruses and the filters are not uh, um, uh, small enough uh, for, for this virus. Another very important question for me, the most important one is today we know that the most important way of transmission of COVID-19 is our uh, droplets and especially aerosols. And they came out, uh, it's really, I cannot understand. Uh, here is. Now you got your mouse. Yeah, I got my mouse. Yes, yeah. that's perfect. So um, there's a paper on the left side, visualizing speech generated oral flute droplets. And uh, if you see this video here, it should, uh, uh, yeah. 
droplets visualized by laser by laser light without a mask. No, not we're not working. Ah, that's that's not working. I should I show it later to you. Okay. Uh, and there you could see in this video very well what a, how good the protection of a mask is. So, and now I come to the end. Really difficult. Is there a separate uh, file for the video? Then you can just play it. Yeah. Uh, let me see if I can use it in that way. Yeah. Now I'm recording. So he's recording. Stay healthy. Without a mask. Great. Stay. Ah. Now I'm recording. Stay healthy. Great. Stay healthy. Great. That's loud. Stay healthy. Even if he speaks less loud, many, many droplets. And with a mask, a normal mask, not an FFP recording? two yeah. or three. Stay healthy. Nothing. Louder. Stay healthy. Nothing. Louder. Stay healthy. Nothing. Nothing. You see how protective a normal mask is. And so I, I'd like to show you a little in this video how we went back to elective surgery. Of course, everybody has to wear marks, everybody has to um, respect social distancing. And then we went back. So every country wanted to open the country. Okay, and in the endoclinic, the lights went on again uh, four weeks ago. So what we are doing, we call our patients two days before admission and go together by phone with him through a questionnaire where we're asking after symptoms, where we're asking after hospital stay during the last two weeks and so on. And if the secretary is filling every answer out with a no, the patient is allowed to come to the hospital. So, and the entrance in our hospital is very restricted. So uh, we, you have to ring a bell to go in. Here's our patient again. He is going in and he is guided in the hospital by marks on the, on the floor to avoid face-to-face -face encounter. It's a one-way system that we established in our hospital. First step is he goes to the test. Every patient who is undergoing into surgery is tested. That means the patient is coming one day before, is tested, four to six hours later we get the results, and then the patient is going to the anesthesist, and again the anesthesist is going with him through the questionnaire. And if everything is okay, the patient is allowed to go on the ward. Follow the lines. And here is, I think it's the same in India. We limited the number of persons in our elevators. And then the treatment can start and the normality is coming back a little bit. And the door is open to our normal business and our OR is um, very busy again. And so I, I mentioned it already, we are doing almost 100% of our cases. Visitors are extremely uh, limited. And no, usually no visitors is, are allowed because they are not tested. Uh, uh, every visitor in special situation get in permission, must get in permission by the director, that means by me. Here's the algorithm, again, pre-sent uh, pre information on, on intra-hospital corona protection, pre-inpatient telephone screening, if screening is negative, admission is possible, then he 
uh, here are all the precautions that we have at our hospital. We have a green zone, a yellow zone, a red zone. Usually everybody who is in the green zone uh, is going for, um, uh, for the operation. I mentioned it, fortunately, during the last 800 cases, we had no COVID-19 positive patient. It's a very, very fragile structure. If we have one patient with COVID-19 who transmits it to other patients, then we can close the hospital again. Everybody, everybody in this hospital is aware about it. So we are extremely careful when we treat our patients. But I guess in this situation, with these precautions, you are quite safe. Yeah, thank you. What, what do you do to your laminar airflow? Do you operate in laminar airflow theater? Yeah. Or? We operate in laminar airflow fields uh, without any changings. So we operate like in normal times because we had the questionnaire, the patient is tested, the patient is safe. So we have no special uh, uh, PPEs, nothing. So we operate like in normal times if the patient passes all, passed already all these steps. And uh, before discharge, again, the patient is tested for COVID or? Uh, before the before discharge? The no, 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 that's not, no, not needed because the patient is just here. He, the patient has to wear a mask. Every staff member wears a mask. I'm not wearing a mask at the moment because I'm sitting alone in my office, but uh, uh, usually everybody has to wear a mask. Uh, even the patients, every visitor. So until now, we had no positive case. If we take a patient from another institution, we only take him if he is negative. We ask the other institution to perform a test, and when the test is negative, we take him. If we have an emergency case like a sepsis or a severe fracture, we take him in our red zone here in the hospital where he is completely isolated from every other patient until he is negative uh, tested uh, again. Okay. okay. Yeah, that's it. The last question, then we can move on to our cases. Please unmute yourself. Uh, Thompson, you said you don't use the helmet. So how do you perform this? You know, you're just wearing mask or what protection, what you have? Normal, normal mask, what I'm normally using, a normal surgical mask and uh, gloves. Eye protecting uh, glasses, glasses. Glasses, glasses was one with our, who are completely com protecting my whole face. That's all. Okay. Some of my patients use shields, but no helmets. Okay. So thank you, Thurston, for that extensive, you know, exposition of about you know, infection and joint replacement, single stage, double stage, you know, thank you at so last to end with COVID-19. Now we'll move on to our cases. So uh, we I, should... Can I say, because I'm, I'm very sorry, I have also some other commitments. Um, no problem. I have to leave, unfortunately. I'm very sorry because they knocked all on my door here already. Uh, no problem. No, From on no, behalf no. of uh, Indian Arthroplasty Association, uh, it's a pleasure and honor to have you with us. And thank you very much uh, for devoting the time in spite of your busy schedule. Thank Hope you. Hope to see you again soon in India. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, bye. Bye. bye bye to all of you. Thank bye. you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. So, we start our uh, presentations. Uh, may I request BJ to share your screen and uh, uh, go ahead with the first presentation. Okay. Right, so um, great uh, talks by uh, Thurston and uh, Jay. So we go on to our discussion.
so this is um, okay so this is uh, my patient uh, uh, at the age of 25 he had a is actually a case of angst born so he had bilateral uh, as performed actually this was performed in delhi and in um, so that was in 2007 so he was 26 years of age then then six, uh, he was doing okay for 6 uh, years and following which uh, he had pain in his right hip and he had a very elevated uh, cobalt chromium ions so he, he underwent a revision of the uh, uh, the right hip so the cemented all cement revision cemented socket and a cemented stem uh, and then he uh, presented to us with this picture that was um, sorry i just go back to the previous one yeah so he uh, um, had this revision this was done in uh, um, 2016 sorry 14 so that was done in 2014 and and uh, this revision was done so both cemented uh, exeter stem cemented cup and two years later he presented to us with this uh, x ray of a failing cup on this side yeah so the uh, question is what to do i think we are out of time so i'll just proceed yes, please um so we have to do a culture has been uh, emphasized by uh, austin and uh, jay so we did a culture we usually do it under siam sometimes we do it under ultrasound guidance and is uh, lab parameters by yes are 24 crp8 total count and uh, neutrophils are 58 so um, the, you know the uh, mr didn't show any uh, Uh, also so um, i mean uh, ideally uh, based on i think jay's uh, presentation today probably in philly they would have uh, done another tap after some time but you know we have our own compulsions uh, patient has come elsewhere it's a private practice i mean uh, you can't be too theoretical so with all these parameters we decided to uh, proceed with uh, one stage aseptic revision anybody would uh, Uh, would think differently in india no i think uh, when the asr crp is okay and uh, you have a dry tap uh, um, you should go ahead with uh, one stage the revision yeah so we went ahead with that so that was the pair of findings so we uh, did a cement in cement revision as you can see here uh, that's because we need access to the uh, the socket so there was a huge bone loss from 12 o'clock to 4 o'clock portion had to remove the cup i had a very good uh, cementation so we were able to do a good and there was no pus or there was no uh, alter there was no metal reaction so everything looked very this thing and i think one thing that we lack when you compare to endocrinic and philly is that perop diagnosis is what i think we really lack in our country i mean you can talk about uh, leukocyte x-rays and uh, frozen section and doing a you know synovial uh, count and things perop but uh, decision making based on that is very tough i think i'm sure you all agree with that so we tried bits and pieces of we are very good we are as good as uh, those guys uh, pre op and uh, you know our post op post op regimens are uh, getting to be equally good but i think our per op uh, diagnosis where we really lack today so this was the uh, thing uh, so we put a 58 gryption uh, cup and we put a 15 to 10 uh, tm augment you can see the steps of that and that was the um, that was the post op reconstruction picture we have done a cement and cement revision on the femoral side now the the perioperative culture was positive and this was sort of a, a very uh, rare organ of bacolaria spatiae um, so that was what we grew on the perop cultures so we are protocol of sending perop cultures so we followed up the, the routine uh, esr cr assessment and he was on two weeks of iv antibiotics as per the international now uh, consensus he was on four weeks of oral antibiotic and then he had a two week um, antibiotic off period and then his uh, parameters were like this so they were good and even after the uh, antibiotic uh, uh, off period eight week his parameters were uh, were normal so we uh, you know we just like the international consensus now we thought that um, everything is fine now just a word about this organism it's an aerobic gram negative uh, bacillus it's found in aquatic environments and this is an organism of very low virulence and the frequent colonizer of fluids used in hospital you know irrigation solution intra it's supposed to be a colonizing thing of that 
of course you know this was not from our hospital the index surgery so he was doing well and one year post op uh, he was happy with the result but 16 months he came to us with his failing implant then at that time his esi was 70 and cf was 36 so now um, you know within one and a half years it has failed and now uh, you know because he had a pgi we knew that uh, you know what we missed was the pgi now if we had done something like a you know a non a revision on the femoral side as well we probably would could have called a one stage revision but this is since we retained all the cement uh, it really we didn't have a good debridement so we you know that would be that we would think that that is the cause of failure anybody has got any other thoughts on this i think you have to go ahead with the two stages now you have to take out everything put yes. cement spacer treat with uh, antibiotics there is uh, no other uh, choice so, here vijay yeah. so, uh, yes please was, yes. Uh, when you did the first revision what yes. was the culture uh, was the culture negative at the time of first revision no he told he, no he, 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 he sr to thr we, we, we have already no, told that. we have no records of that no, no he that has not been uh, you know we don't have records of that done elsewhere we don't have records of that yeah because that is the time probably the infection must have been uh, could have been picked up isn't yeah, that's correct but as um, you know dasan was saying we don't have dedicated uh, centers you yeah. may not even have joint replacement centers somebody who does you know trauma does a revision for infection thing like that and that's why we sort of miss out these things i think so we plan yeah. for a two stage revision and this is our way of doing it uh, we never put a arcuate spacer we put a individual dowel in the fema an individual uh, ball in the we never have any problems with the overriding femur etc we never have any problems we have no complications with side of this kind of spacers it works very well in our hands so again the same organism grew buckled especially on the second thing as well and then uh, he again went on to uh, antibiotic and um, uh, i don't have the results of that but he was fine because he, he was selling it from delhi and i don't have really but once his thing became normal we took him for second stage uh, surgery so again we had bone loss this time we decided to use a, a tm shell so we had to put a large tm shell and uh, that was the thing and this time of course the most important thing is uh, we have uh, revised the uh, uh, the femur as well that's the difference between the first division and the second and if i have noticed in the interim is other asr became painful and i had to do a, a, a thr on that side as well so this is three year follow up and he is very pleased with the result so this case is being presented that every unexplained early failure i mean you can't explain failure is probably a low virulent organism and i think we must all keep that in mind although you are it is low virulence it is difficult to grow it that that all adds up so when you can't explain the failure aseptic failure then it is infection that i think is the uh, moral of the story yeah so yeah you know there are two three you know important messages from this that first one that what vijay told that early failure leads to infection within two years if your hip is failing then 50% chances that it will be infection number two even if the esr and crp is normal that uh, you cannot exclude infection because of this low virulent organisms like burkholdia also in some other organisms that are low growing organism the esr crp will be normal so you go ahead with the you know single stage revision but during every revision one should remember that to take the cultures of the tissue samples from membranes from around the femoral side from the acetabular side the joint fluid minimum 5 to 6 samples to should be taken and post operatively number 3 if it has come out to be infection that is a type 1 infection that means you know you have done a um, infection is supposedly for aseptic revision so in those cases the antibiotic has to be continued for about to say 6 to 8 weeks or ja bijay any uh, any any questions on this vijay uh, my my question to you is uh, what is your your experience the most of the culture positive you find from the implant wash or you find from the other uh, uh, these tissue samples so tissue samples we have so we have the, the implant wash has been the most uh, important uh, um, i'm not sure about that uh, the consent statement says you know you have minimum five samples uh, deep samples uh, you have to take tissue and you know inoculating into the blood culture bottles when you have an, uh, you know fluid there 
all those consent statement uh, guidelines we follow our yield rate is quite high i must say yield rate is quite high when we do when we follow these protocols um, but um, uh, subranshu let me ask you what would you have done differently in this uh, case no uh, i would have done the similar same way that uh, since uh, asr crp is normal aspiration was negative so i would have gone ahead with the single stage revision and but intra operatively many times i send frozen section i tell the patho people beforehand and i take from the most inflamed site i take the tissues and send it and if i find that there are more than 10 polymorphonuclear cells for hyper field then i would have put a spacer and uh, come out uh, during that time but if it is you know 5 to 10 or less than 5 it is doubtful i would have gone ahead with a single cell revision like you did and sent the samples five six samples for culture post operatively uh, vijay can i ask you something uh, yes. <clears throat> see this uh, particular organism that is there is very rare so do you speak to your microbiologist or for that case even mohanty who does lot of infection work do you speak to your microbiologist that uh, to culture them differently or this is through routine culture that you got this uh, organism no no we we talk to the microbes all the time and immediately they will call us and tell us you know that this is what they are finding provisionally and you got to be in constant touch with the microbes that's one of the secrets of uh, how we can do well they, they you know we have a whatsapp group and uh, we are in constant uh, the id guy as well and so it's like a, you know everybody is on the game and that's yes. why that's how you pick up all this yeah yes you know Monty. just to add to you that to sir so do you go for an extended spectrum for all your specimens yes yes absolutely okay. you know we have but uh, uh, you know fact, this uh, you know after the experience that we had with this case and a uh, few similar cases um, now what i would do is uh, 2020 we got the same patient i would do a full one stage revision you know okay. i would i would treat as infection i would have taken the cement out and i have done and i would do only one stage but i would do one stage i wouldn't have left the cement in you know the biofilm and all that uh, now i would have done that I would yes, treat sir. this a classical case for our people to do one stage. Yes, sir. Do it at the one stage, and your chance of success be very high. I think. Yeah. No, yes, you sir. you have to send the samples immediately to the laboratory for culture. You don't keep the sample there. That is a biggest mistake. What we see in our in our scenario. Number two, micromolecules has to do extended culture from 14 to 21 days. in some of our institutes you know like just look hospital and all they, they in every sample they do this extended culture but they don't inform you if it doesn't become you know positive positive so you go ahead with your treatment and all these things and if it becomes positive they will call you and they will inform that it has become positive after 14 days or 21 days yes last question asit and before we move on yes. to the next question vijay again for a single stage revision you know as thorsten just told us we should have the organism you know we should have that organism that this is the organism and this is the antibiotic that is susceptible to it in your your case you mentioned that you would have gone with the first stage if this case was presenting to you today no the, the, the situation is we don't know it's infected yeah it's query infected and we don't know the the, the the bug is not there because we think it's not infected yeah so it's a little different dog we don't we are not dealing with pgi there only query infected case we only have not explained the failure So right. putting all things together, it's better to go and do it as in one stage. This is your classical case. They gain experience to do in one stage. Yeah, so your chance will be high. This is not PGI. Quite different. Yeah. Yeah. Before we go to Kalai's case, uh, how many of us do one stage revision? A any of the faculty? Yeah, we have done isolated cases. Only in, in limited number of cases where where you know the infect the bacteria uh, before time. and the host uh, strength uh, the patient is healthy uh, no comorbid conditions like the uncontrolled diabetes or rheumatoid yeah. only these cases okay so um, dr kalai banan uh, can you go ahead with your presentation please yes sir thank you sir am i audible yes please yes sir so we broadly classify the two treatments one is uh, invasive and non invasive here we are sharing one case He is like 42 year old male, known ankylosing spondylitis, HLA-B27 positive. He was on sulfasalazin tablet. He got his left hip uh, replaced in 2017, and after two years, he came for to us to get his right side done. He is a known alcoholic, and the BMI is on a bit of upper side on 32. So it was like uh, uh, just a straightforward case. So the surgery went fine. Initial four days, 
was uneventful. He was about to get discharged. And it was a Sunday, so he wanted to go on Monday because of the insurance. So Sunday night, he had a party with his friends. He had some outside food. Monday morning, he developed diarrhea and a fever of, of around like 100. So we put him on a prophylactic IV antibiotics. Generally, we gave uh, uh, Sufasif and uh, this time we gave injection Magnus Ford. And abdominal, on uh, day six, he had abdominal pain, but he was moving around. Seven, abdominal discomfort, but no hip pain. And eighth day, he started having pain in the knee joint and the swelling. And uh, is a bit of feverish, rigors and chills. Sir. So we thought it would be some reactive. And uh, nine, it was a bit more severe. So we were thinking of, uh, since obese, we thought of it might be a DVT. So we did a venous Doppler. There was no DVT. Then we wanted to find a focus, anything uh, above the diaphragm or below the diaphragm. So we did a CT screening, but nothing, no pulmonary embolism and no other collection. But uh, it showed some subcutaneous collection over the distal thigh and in the suprapatellar region. And we have the habit of doing ESR CRP whenever the patient has some implants. So his uh, ESR CRP was within normal limits. And so that's the reason we proceeded for the second, stay, uh, second side of hip replacement. So because it was a fever and chills, generally our ID team thinks of like dengue, malaria, because we get a lot of patients coming from outside. So dengue, malaria, that uh, everything was negative. But the CRP was way rocket high of 400 plus. D-dimer, we nowadays started doing yeah, D-dimer and interleukin-6. That was also like high. Procalcitonin, yeah, it was also high. So we did a bedside uh, uh, ultrasound guided knee aspiration. And we made sure that it goes into a direct inoculation with the pediatric back and bottle. And uh, the 24-hour signal uh, grew something like uh, echinella cordon, which is a gram negative, and the streptococcus constellitis, which is a gram positive. And uh, even the fifth day, Growth also confirmed those things, those two things, which was like unusual. So, and uh, the, well, yesterday, within the 24 hours of aspiration, we didn't have any much time. The infection was much more severe. His whole of the thigh became red and uh, the it, uh, liters of uh, pus started pouring from the surgical side. So, we just took him to the OT without any delay. And uh, we have, we do a radical debridement, almost an oncological basis type of, uh, we start from the layers, skin, we clean it up, scar and the subcutaneous, then open the fascia and then go into the joint. And uh, we do with a very aggressive manner, two times and everything. And uh, surprisingly here, the muscles and fascia was like uh, in other infections like Clubsell and gram negative, some you will feel a scar tissue or tethering of the tissue. Here, nothing was there. All the muscle fibers, everything was like perfect. We can see a sheet of uh, pus flowing through all the, from the joint to the, in the subcutaneous level, just like a leveling or a lesion it was looking. And we also, for, then we also do the uh, rule of three. Three minutes of beta din, we soak it, wash it with again high uh, pulse jet lavage, and again we soak it with three minutes of hydrogen peroxide, and again wash it out, and again we used to so good with uh, three minutes of vancomycin. We uh, strongly believe that almost all the infections are polymicrobial. So we, uh, since we target more of gram positive in IV, we used to give vancomycin soakage for three minutes. Then again, wash it with. And uh, we, like it was a tough case, unclosing spondylitis, we just changed the ball, ceramic ball alone. And uh, we were not sure because when we saw the litters of us, whether we do have to revise the implant or it's just, we, and we don't want to do a half at a job. Since uh, we are taken for a wash, we give the full effort to save the joint. And we made sure that uh, uh, five samples have been sent for the culture method. And whenever we do a diet on a basis, we used to add extra amount of uh, antibiotic in the, um, in the form of intraosseous uh, 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 antibiotic or some stimulants or even a catheter. But this case was very particular and it was within a two weeks, such a huge pouring pus, we don't want to add something like stimulants. And uh, for all of our primary cases, we don't keep drain. But this was a bit unusual. Here, uh, we know it was like uh, not a routine infection. And uh, it was like a, we can see the sheet of flowing all over the thigh. So we had two drains, deep drains and two superficial drains. And the deep drains generally we keep in almost all of our revision cases for a period of two to three days. But here we kept it for a period of nine days because the amount of collection from the joint deep uh, was coming down. But the superficial remained around like 100 plus and we had to remove it uh, like 18 30 because we don't want to take chance because it might form a sinus. And uh, followed by we uh, you, we used a Smith, uh, uh, Smith and a few cup, pico dressing twice, uh, two sittings for six days. And this was the final result. The wound got completely uh, healed up and everything was fine. So at the end of the day, we had a meeting with the ID team. So we had two organisms and from the synovial fluid aspiration. 
and from the tissues, three tissues and two post culture. We make sure that the three tissue samples, one goes for manual method, uh, routine agar plate method, and one goes for the automated where we have the Malditub, which uh, throws signals in 24 hours and the final comes in the fifth day. And MicroPack 2, it includes uh, gram strain, AFD strain, aerobic, anaerobic, fungal, and also MGIT, and they keep it for a 45 days to just to rule out uh, TB. In case of, in this case, we had a doubt of TB, so we sent a gene expert also that was also negative. And the pus manual method initially grew gram positive, but uh, the fifth day didn't grow anything. Automated grew both uh, uh, preliminary and a final came as methicillin resistant Staphylococcus epidermidis. So we went through the literature and we have a WhatsApp group uh, uh, in touch with the infectious disease specialist, microbiologist, and the pathologist. And we also grew, um, go through, gone through the literature, like which will be like suiting the streptococcus. And all these organisms uh, are not new and uh, all uh, some uh, case reports are there in relation with the PGA. So this is the HRI follow-up sheet, uh, follow sheet. So here we routinely follow up with the antibiotics and the ESR, CRP and the, play, and the hemoglobin level. If you watch carefully from like uh, October and to like 22, there was a constant uh, drop in hemoglobin, which is, uh, and uh, uh, there are, here CRP was rocket high. Initially, uh, he was on sufacept, and when he had a diarrhea, we gave an injection, magnusfoot and targosid. When the sinofluid aspiration result came, we started him on uh, its sensitive tigicycline augmenting. And uh, again, but the total count went into uh, 40,000. So we had to add augmenting. It was like a much more antibiotic dose, which we didn't uh, use to, which was like a, we don't uh, give repeatedly. And we had a three blood uh, transfusions. And uh, after this uh, final discussion, we found tigicycline was effective. 100 was given as a stat and 50 BD thrice. And uh, once the ESR CRP was like within the range, the uh, three consecutive readings of more than three weeks, then we shifted him to uh, oral antibiotics. And whenever we have implant, we consider rifampicin. That also works good for MRSE and as well as the streptococcus. And uh, levofloxacin works and minocycline, especially for the echinella. And uh, for uh, two weeks, we gave uh, three antibiotics and uh, they made sure that the CRP was within normal limit. Then we shifted him on two antibiotic dosage and our uh, rifampicin and the rivofloxacin. And whenever we give antibiotic for a, more than a period of two months, we have the habit of giving fluconazole one dose, just like a prophylactic uh, measure and uh, also like uh, augments. And uh, we made sure that uh, the CRP still remained within the normal limit. Generally, we aim for less than 10 and ESR less than 40, but here it was surprisingly much more less and uh, the antibiotics was stopped. This was the latest rating which shows like uh, improvement in the hemoglobin and the ESR CRP is like so. So this case was like much more particular because the litters of litters pouring from within the second week and uh, we uh, almost like initially we thought we have to revise all the implants. While we are planning for a two stage seeing the pus, but we did a dare and we gave antibiotics quite a long time. Anyway, the, the, it's been like nine, uh, almost like seven months follow up. It is very short to say anything, but uh, DARE works better when uh, you do your debridement and uh, culture, you, when you talk with the ID people, microbiologists and histopathologists and come to a conclusion. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Kalei. That was a very good case. The, uh, so can you just uh, tell us what are the indications of dire for the benefit of our delegates? Yeah. So like say, so can you stop is, sharing your screen? Yeah. Yeah. Sir. yeah. So whenever like uh, the infection we see uh, as uh, the students have described when it is like less than three weeks uh, when the uh, biofilm is not formed, we are make sure we are like hundred percent sure that the dire is going to work. And uh, in conditions like uh, we have a HRI PJS PJRI score in which like uh, we give inputs uh, to the all the uh, comorbidities and all the facts. So uh, depending upon the HRI score, we decide like which is going to work much more better. And uh, like for another case, a old lady uh, like uh, she came with uh, this like she had she was not having diabetes, hypertension, or nothing. She was almost like five, five years follow up, TKR, everything was fine. But we have already used a stem because of osteoporotic bone. But when she presented with it, it was almost with a pus. But our score, uh, scoring system, she had a very less score. She was in the green zone. 
and uh, so we this was a case ideally we uh, we took it for a dire procedure we didn't uh, the implants was also confirmed that it was uh, intraoperatively stable we gave a thorough washout uh, and aggressive we added stimulants and antibiotic and everything and uh, uh, she was under chronic antibiotic suppression therapy for a while almost for like seven months we had a regular follow up with the esr crp and everything and this works so we have to choose the uh, uh, cases which is meant for diet so we believe that we give a scoring system based on their comorbidities age sex and all these things and if it is the green zone it works sometimes the patient comes where they are like where not like medically fit we had like a couple of patients because more than the people living more than 80 years it's getting more and more and those are getting replacement is also more and more we have a couple of patients who can't withstand the uh, surgical procedure of more than say one and a half hours like one stage revision or a two stage revision or a bone loss they can can't afford that time there works as a principle where you reduce the bacterial load so that the amount of antibody going to be given is also comes short so this is going to help you so it depends upon like uh, how you choose the patient so yearly cases yes it works and uh, chronic cases with the less agri pj score yes it works and it can be a one of the salvage procedure or a helpful procedure in patients old patients even though there is like esr crp like high and they can't afford for a one stage or two stage yeah you know debridement antibiotics and implant rotation it yes, works if you in acute infections less than 3 weeks of duration or the joint age is less than 3 weeks yes sir there are two indications but there are certain you know uh, poor prognostic indicators if the esr is more than 60 uh, i'm mean, sorry the crp is more than 60 or if the rheumatoids inflammatory arthritis if there is a you know presence of a sinus or yes. the implant is loose these are the conditions where one should not perform a dia now now any of the you know faculties how how many dias should you do the question is that uh, suppose first uh, dia it fails do you do go for a second dia or you go for a two stage revision how many dias should you do one right. you know if uh, if we have done the dia it's one but if uh, you know like anything else you get specialized at it yeah so if done outside we would repeat the dia that suddenly if they come acutely we are quite happy to to repeat the dia Yeah, that's what i meant if you have done one and then straight away two stage revision if the first yes. dire which you have done has failed yeah so only one dire is uh, indicated after that then uh, you should go ahead with the two stage revision yes uh, krishna the uh, uh, literature says two you can uh, look at two dires no. you have done or anybody if you do more than two dires there is high failure that's the literature and uh, previous question on uh, one stage uh, selection criteria the paper which dr thorsten showed on the argensons group from france they looked at a pre selected criteria versus no selection criteria for one stage revision and they found no difference so there was one group of surgeons who was doing one stage revision irrespective of the organism they don't know the organism the comorbid condition and they looked at the other centers which were doing a uh, revision and said a large series of almost 1100 patients and they found that it's very unclear at this point in time or an impractical to say okay this is a criteria for one stage uh, to identify the organism it's almost impossible to identify the organism in all the situations so their uh, rate of culture negative was almost 35% so what they found in their study was whether you had criteria for doing single stage or no criteria the outcome was not much different okay so one more important uh, thing about dare that dare should not be done as a emergency procedure if you have diagnosed the patient you know as infection if you have decided that you do in the next next day in the routine theater rather than doing it in the emergency theater uh, you know as you do in a fracture surgery or anything that is one of the recommendations so uh, let's go ahead with the next uh, presentation by dr sanjeev jain Yeah. Can you unmute yourself? <laughs> okay. Am I audible now? Yeah. All right. Fine. Sorry. So it's a very uh, short case. Uh, uh, the patient who is a 49 years old gentleman who had an acetabular fracture. 
uh, implant was done and it's got infected and uh, so this is a pre-op x-rays uh, he was operated elsewhere uh, and within three months time uh, he had an infection uh, he came back to me. They have done the debridement twice, I suppose, in another institution. And he came back to me with a, a discharging sinus with the naturally high CBC, uh, CRP, and ESR. So, uh, and uh, this was done in that institute uh, from where he had come uh, with an unstable uh, spacer because of the posterior fig at the time of removal of the implant probably that posterior fragment was also removed completely, which was or absorbed, whatever it may be. And uh, he came to me with this situation. He was painful as well because he couldn't walk. Uh, so uh, since uh, there was a discharging sinus, uh, CRP and ESR was raised. Uh, we have thoroughly uh, taken it out and uh, debrided uh, the whole thing. And we left him as an excision orthoplasty because uh, anything which you could put it here, uh, possibly because of the defect, uh, uh, we could not uh, have a successful uh, spacer inside. So <clears throat> I left it in like this and put him on the sensitive, it was staff uh, sensitive antibiotics uh, as uh, suggested by all other faculties earlier. And uh, uh, within three to four months, uh, his CRP, SR came down, he never had any issue. And uh, we did the CD scan uh, preoperatively uh, when we went inside and there was a defect in the definitely posterior superior wall uh, which was not there and then uh, we have to reconstruct it uh, this was an interop picture there was uh, practically it was very clean uh, at the time of operation this was an acetabulum which was and we had uh, to put like which I showed uh, the uh, augments there the posterior superior wall uh, we reconstructed it and uh, this is an interop picture. Uh, uh, we had put an uncemented socket and uncemented stem with ceramic and poly. And this was the final reconstruct. It's around six to eight weeks now for uh, him to have this surgery done. And this was the uh, post-op uh, for the socket and the stem stable. Of course, he's on non-weight wearing walking at present time. And I'm waiting, awaiting. Uh, the further progress and see next six months with one year time what happens. So this was the whole thing uh, about this patient where the uh, implant failure, infection, unstable spacer, we reconstructed the posterior wall after everything was fine and uh, uh, we had put him into six weeks of oral antibiotic discharge. Thank you. So one important message from this case is that uh, when there's an unstable spacer, infection doesn't get controlled. So now now question is that, uh, what are the criteria of putting a proper spacer inside a hip? Uh, any Anyone like to take that? Can you stop sharing your screen, please? Yeah. Yeah, what are the criteria for putting a proper spacer inside a hip? Yeah, the, so the first thing is that spacer has to be stable. And number two, most of the times, you know, we give the neck shaft angle is more, like, you know, 125, 135 degree. When there's a valgus, you know, angle, the spacer usually is unstable. unstable. So ideally, when you put a spacer, one has to give little varus or, you know, your neck shaft angle should be maybe around, say, 100 degrees or something like that, because it's, it's a temporary spacer. And uh, I, I'll just, uh, you know, share the screen, just uh, uh, show you one thing. But uh, uh, Dr. Mohanty, this was basically yeah. a posterior wall fragment, but the posterior uh, wall was yeah. not there practically. Yeah. That's why this spacer was unstable. So I would like to have a question to, especially to the Vijay, uh, in such situation, uh, when there's no posterior wall, what do you do uh, as far as the spacer is concerned? <clears throat> Well, as I um, said in the thing, all our spacers, no matter situation, we put non-articulated spacers. Yes. Uh, we'll put a ball in the socket uh, that definitely stays there, and then we'll put a separate dowel in the femur. Now, uh, I got to qualify what Dr. Mohanty said. Uh, when you say uh, you know that there uh, you cannot uh, infection will not subside when there is uh, instability, it is not to the joint. It is in the in a in a long bone. What you're talking about in a joint. There is no question of uh, instability. Joint is meant to move. 
so that doesn't apply directly here so when you use a non organic spacer infection will uh, subside <coughs> you cannot mix uh, a long bone and a joint that's completely different uh, context yeah. Uh, Vijay, yeah. you can you can put in that case what Vijay told that you can put two separate spaces uh, on the femoral side as well on the vestibular side, or else you can put you know multiple you know antibiotic beads inside the cerebellum as well as on the femoral side. Yeah, yeah, Rajiv. Yeah, but the Supreme Show, this say instability, instability does not work with spacer. That's a different concept. Not confuse that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the purposes for the uh, for putting the spacer are two. One that it is filling up the dead space, and second is that it is keeping the tension of the soft tissues till the time you are you are coming back for the revision. So, which yes. your method is very good that you have the two separate things. But what is the harm if you are able to put a spacer which is like a, a normal implant uh, because that will also yes. maintain the tissue tension and it will make the final surgery much more easier for you. I, I will tell you, it doesn't make your final surgery easier because you know we are so used to operating on dysplastic hips, high riding hips. So a little bit of shortening for any one of us uh, releasing is not a problem. Right. And the two is when you put an artery space there and it dislocates like this case, or it has a fracture. But more important than all that, I find that it's eventually bone loss because it's loose. It tends to either uh, have established bone loss or femoral bone loss if you if you don't uh, simulate properly. If you simulate properly. Then removing that cement at the time of surgery takes uh, 40 minutes, one hour, and that's the time, precious time that you have for revision surgery. Yeah. So we don't like to waste time during a revision surgery. We just take it off in one second and we get on with the revision surgery. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. Uh, hip situation, uh, it's a difficult than knee. So it's always instability is a big problem. So if you put two spacers, I think that is a viable option. Yeah, I just uh, show share a video, two minutes video, that uh, how we put our spaces. This is a new indigenous templates made of poly selection. This material is autoclavable and reusable. This is soft, malleable. You can adjust the offset, length, adjust the diameter because there are five different sizes available. This one is 41 diameter. You can adjust the version also, and it provides a rotational stability, and it easily can be removed during second stage. You can use one of these like K-nail or you know, Elijah of Rod or Ross nail, depending on the canal diameter. As you can see here, that you put it like that, you adjust the offset there. So this is like you know high offset. If you do like that, then it is you know low offset. So this is a small video just to see that uh, how to prepare the spacer there. And these are reusable, autoclavable hundred times. Uh, you can use this. So these are dislocated, infected uh, bipolar. This is the lateral view. So always excise the sinus tract there. So take out your extraction of the prosthesis, whatever way you, you, you can do. Then you throw thorough lavas with, uh, with the betadine, hydrogen peroxide, you use the pulse lavas. This is a K-nail which you are bending with the you know, plate bender. So you bend it and to desired degree angle you can give. Then these are the templates which are available. So you take the antibiotics first, to thoroughly mix the powder with the cement powder, then we add the liquid. So after it is prepared, then you put it inside the template, like that, the cement. Then you put the bent uh, kennel inside it and put all the cement inside, give the desired degree of uh, you know, offset there. Then you hold it uh, till it uh, sets. So when this is being prepared, the whatever cement is left uh, with you, you can prepare the cement beads with uh, taking the you know stainless steel wire. And now the cement is just about to set. Uh, at this point of time, you can take your nibbler or you know any bone cutter, just trim up or whatever excessive cement is there. And now your spacer is ready there. Now put it inside the kennel and uh, it just snugly fits inside this kennel. And as you can see here, if it doesn't fit snugly, if the canal is wide, you can put a little bit of cement, uh, one other packet of cement and you know, set it like that. So you put these bits in the soft tissues. That is the post-operative x-ray of this patient. And patient can walk immediately there. So at this point, if the bone is osteoporotic or it doesn't snugly fit, then you can put another packet of cement there just to cement uh, the spatial into the proximal part of the femur there. So that is immediate post-operative mobilization.
uh, this is one of the patient where, you know, it's excised hip. Vijay knows about this case, who was 12 times operated, infection not controlled, and multiple incision, multiple discharging sinuses, patient is not able to walk because of the, you know, unstable situation there. So we put our patient that is in August 2015. And, uh, you know, the infection got controlled. It is just about six weeks. And, but the pressure broke because a patient walked uh, over it, heavyweight patient, because of more neck up angle probably. But though the infection got controlled at six weeks, I didn't want to go ahead with the second stage surgery. So I did the, uh, that was the 13th surgery. This is the 14th surgery. Here I took a, you know, a cemented uh, CDH kind of prosthesis, stacked it over a canal, and with our uh, template, we prepared the spacer. Then it put the spacer in, and uh, then the infection, of course, was controlled in June 2016, converted to a second stage, and that is about uh, three and a half years uh, follow up of this patient. Working with a little bit of abductor lurch on the left side because of repeated surgery, and that was the 15th surgery, and the infection uh, is controlled in this patient. Fantastic. So, uh, is there any question from the YouTube, uh, Abhinav? Uh, yes, sir, we've got one question regarding the something that has not been discussed till yet is uh, what about fungal con uh, infections in the joints? Does everyone go for a routine fungal detection or does, do you have a special indication when you should uh, suspect a fungal infection in a joint? Yes, uh, uh, anybody would like to take uh, uh, that question? Yeah, we, routine we routinely send culture. for uh, fungal cultures, uh, all our things. Uh, we get tuberculosis and fungal as routine cultures. Yeah. You know, when the when the ESR, CRP are normal, and uh, and if you see that a joint is infected, but ESR, CRP has become normal, these are the indications where there might be low-grade uh, infection, like Burkulia, what uh, Dr. B.J. was uh, showed. You should send it for fungal culture as well as in our country, you should send it for tuberculosis. tuberculosis. Okay. So these are the three things one must look for. So low uh, grade organisms are fungal culture or tuberculosis. And if you find fungus, these are more difficult cases to treat. There uh, you have to add uh, amphotericin B and variconazole. These are the two antifungal agents. What long which, time, long time. Uh, yeah, months. these are available in powder form and uh, you have to treat with antifungal agents for about uh, at least six months, uh, depending upon your you know, infectious disease specialist advice. So let's go ahead with the next. Uh, can I make case? one point about uh, Sanjeev's yes, case? Yes, yeah. 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 So um, uh, Sanjeev, very good result. But uh, I think there must be no indication where you don't put a spacer yeah, for antibody delivery. Uh, you must put some kind of uh, local antibiotic because that's the whole idea of a two-stage. Yes, so, yes, I agree. Uh, you Come must put uh, some kind of uh, antibody delivery local, so, so critical for every patient. Accepted. Very important. Yeah, accepted. Okay, uh, we move on to a case by Dr. Bosley. Let's move on to the knee. Yeah. Yeah, uh, articulating spacer is very important. So I'll give you highlights of one interesting case. So this is a 64 year male, my old patient. 10 years ago, I had done bilateral two stage revision for infection, both the knees with the revision processes. It was successful for 10 years. Right knee got a recurrence of the infection now, about seven years ago. There's a frank thick purse on aspiration. It was streptococcal sensitive to many antibiotics. No infection on left side on aspiration. Diabetes, HbA1c was 9 on insulin, uncontrolled. Obese, BMI 38. So this was a case, left knee was aseptic with periprosthetic fracture, gross osteolysis, which was very unusual. So this is a right side, 10 years post two stage, frank infection, ESR was 120, CRP was 200. And this was a aspiration microbiology report, which shows streptococci sensitive to most of the antibiotics. 10 years ago, old, he had staph aureus, so this was a treatment we did radical debridement, articulating spacer, intraop stable on range of movement. And it was hand molded, which gives a customized quality and quantity of the antibiotics. And over a period of six weeks, ESR came to from 120 to 28. 
CRP 200 to 6. One very important when you, this was a handmade, it has to be very smooth so that there is no particulate debris during movement. And these are the four types of articular spaces available in the uh, literature. Uh, number one is uh, cement on cement molded. Second is metal on poly. Third is cement on cement handmade. And fourth is cement on cement prefabricated. And these are three important factors, debridement, antibiotic selection, and stable spacer. So this is one very interesting article where they have reviewed 34 articles for articulating spacers. And from the uh, uh, literature, so in out of 34, 12 were molded, 11 were metal on poly, 7 were handmade, and 4 articles on prefabricated cement on cement. So issues with articular spacers, stability is very important for articular spacers. Whenever you made a handmade, the surface is very important because whenever you do movement, there's a debris coming from the bone, from the cement, and that can be dangerous. It can lead to fibrosis and additional tissue. Mechanical failure, if sometimes it is thin at some places, it can crack and can cause extra problem. If it is too loose, it, there's a big instability. And one issue with the metal on poly, it is very adhesive for bacterial adhesions. So radical debridement is a key part. And during same time, you must plan for future revision. Do all the whatever measurement and do good planning. And this is what we have done, uh, next gen rotating hinge, which was good, healed very well. Other side, there was a gross osteolysis, aseptic. You can see there's a periprosthetic fracture, osteolysis, both tibia and femur. And we did uh, intramedullary impaction bone graft, trabecular metal cone, femur and tibia, and rotating hinge knee, which was quite stable. And this was seven year follow up, both the RHK and you can see the impaction bone grafting healed very well and both the knee healed very well. There was no issue, seven years post-op. So in conclusion, articular spacer improves mobility of the joint with reduction of arthrofibrosis and is more advanced technology than static, prevents quadricep contracture, preserves bone and better antibiotic delivery because of the movement, better functional outcome post first and second stage surgery. Intraop cement spacer can provide delivery of custom made type of antibiotic and quantity of antibiotic. Infection from one knee usually does not cross across opposite knee, but you should always do operated, I mean infected site first and then go to non-infected for reconstruction. Radical debridement is a big, most important part. Stable, the whatever you make a spacer, it should be stable on range of movement and partial weight bearing should be permitted. Infected side should be done first. Recurrence can occur with different organism. Obesity and uncontrolled diabetes are high risk factors for reinfection. And in this case, aseptic osteolysis could be wear related issue. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bosley. That was excellent that there are, you know, the three types of articulating spacer you can put, either you can mold it on the table himself, uh, as Dr. Bosley shown. Four types, or, four types, yeah. Or you can prepare the, you know, available uh, molds uh, which are available in the market or else uh, you can re-autoclave the extracted prosthesis and uh, put it back with a polyethylene on the TBL side. Uh, what we'll do, we'll, uh, we'll take up Rajiv's case first and then we'll discuss both the cases together because Rajiv is showing a static special. Then you can have, uh, you know, there are a couple of questions from YouTube that when you put static, when you put, you know, uh, dynamic specials. Yeah, Rajiv, please. Uh, th thank you, Shubranchu. I think it's a, it's a wonderful face that has been set up by the two stalwarts of uh, periprosthetic joint infection. 
uh, Jawad Parvizi and Thorsten, an excellent case has shown by, by our colleagues. Uh, now, Shubhranshu, I'll be showing the two-stage revision for an infected knee using the, uh, uh, using the uh, static spacer. So the static spacers are needed in, in various conditions, especially where you have the instability in the area. Eradication of the joint infection and providing a painless functioning joint is important. In my views, the host factors, virulence of the load of the bacteria, and the local wound factors are three most important issues that uh, anyone who's dealing with the periprostatic joint infection should look at it. This is the patient. So he having the discharging sinus over the entire part of the knee. He has difficulty in walking. And most of these patients will have the limited range of uh, This is the post-operative patient of this patient. And you'll see that you can see that there is a some instability, within, but it is not showing the instability that the patient had because this is just a weight bearing x-ray and it is not uh, in the valgus or virus stress. So this patient had not just the uh, infection, but also a grossly unstable joint that you see the virus stress and the valgus stress. And you see that there is a, so much of instability of the spacer and also in the flexion, there was a lot of mismatch between the extension and the flexion gap. Um, the implants were extracted using the fine osteotomes Bone should be preserved as much as possible in all these cases. Minimal bone defect was seen on the on the lateral condyle, and the uh, the cement I try to use remove it using the high speed burr, and that makes it very easy to remove the cement from the small the corners. And that's what you see that the after, after removing the cement, you see a clean joint. Uh, you see a, but you see a significant efficiency of the middle collateral ligament significant inefficiency of the lateral collateral ligament and there was a gross mismatch between the flexion and extension gaps. Now the choice of the uh, cement spacers, um, uh, the, what uh, the had shown very well, the articulating spacers or the cement block. Uh, articulating spacers could be the factory made, the, the company made. You can make it on the table as you see here, both for the femur as well as for the tibia or you can use a, or the autoclaved femur and then uh, make the mold for the tibia. Or you can use a cement block, as you see here. In this patient, we use the cement block because there was an instability. In all these infected cases, I always use this uh, medullary, uh, medullary uh, stem, which is made of the cement. And you can make it very easily by uh, molding by your hand or using the cement gun. The, the front part of the cement gun. You can keep moving it and then at the end of cement setting, you can just uh, tap it tap it off uh, very easily and you have a nice um, uh, rod uh, made of the cement only. You can make a, you can add a small K wire also into it or a Steenman pin or you can just use it just like that. And Paleco cement is preferred because one, it has a good color, which is uh, which which differentiates between the bone and the cement, and also it has a better antibiotic delivery uh, capability. And you must make sure that the wound, after you put the cement spacer, the static one, the, the wound is able to close. It should not be too much of uh, filled in cement that you are not able to close the wound. So this, this is the important thing, and that's what you see the post-operative X-ray. You see the the rods with the K wires and the cement block. If you're not having the Palaco cement, you can just use the methylene blue in the normal cement. The culture of this patient was positive. We normally send six cultures from the medullary cavities, from the implant wash, and we try to stir the implant wash also so that and it, is, it is there for about 20 minutes. We take off the implant wash and all these cultures directly into the bacteria bottles. All the patients uh, as a routine uh, go for the normal culture uh, and, the, and the fungal culture and tubercular culture. This patient had the MRSC, sensitivity was to vancomycin, which was given for a, for a period in intravenous, was given for a period of four weeks. Uh, linozolid was sensitive, 600 mg for three weeks intravenous, and another six weeks it was given oral. We always add rifampicin in, in most of our cases, because rifampicin has a better uh, penetration to the bone, and, and of course we test the sensitivity to rifampicin as well in, in all cases. 
This patient in the revision second stage, you see that the antibiotic is impregnated spacer is visible. The table tubercle osteotomy was done because to make it uh, make the exposure easy in our hand, table tubercle osteotomy is very simple. You make a six to eight centimeter long and at least one and a half centimeter thick uh, table tubercle osteotomy. Uh, remove the all the the cement. Remove the uh, the intramedullary spacers, which is very easy to remove. And again, the implant wash of the cement should be sent at the time of the second stage revision. Use the high-speed burr to clean the, uh, the bone, uh, which is a very uh, good way to clean the bone. And you see that when you use a static spacer for a period of almost uh, three months, you see that the flexion gap is uh, reasonably balanced. Extension gap is reasonably balanced because the fibrous tissue formation takes place. Uh, um, the, otherwise, you had to use the rotating hinge for such a patient. But if you use the, uh, the the static spacers, you may be able to take uh, take uh, to to have the benefit of uh, stability, which is because of the fibrous tissue, and you may be able to use a less constrained implant. You see the the spacer in flexion, spacer in is in, in extension, and that's what you see after the implantation, and the trial implants and final implant and the final close close hold. That's what you see the X-ray of this patient at the at the follow-up of two years. Usually, to fix the tibial tubercle osteotomy, you just need the two screws. And you see this patient who has almost a 90-degree uh, function of the of the knee. You see this patient walking. The knee is stable at the follow-up of two years, and she has a reasonably good function. And that's the X-ray at seven years. You see the function at seven years. And you see this function at seven years. So even if the patient is having the instability, the second stage revision, uh, after achieving the fibrous uh, tissues, um, uh, the, the stability with the fibrous tissues, you use the surgery very carefully, uh, do not release too much. And in these patients, you are able to have a very stable joint using the minimal constraint, which is the TC3 implant here. Uh, thank you, Shubhraj. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Rajiv. Very good uh, learning points. The uh, first thing is that uh, you know um, uh, when there is an instability in the knee, then you put a static spacer, so that provides stability to the joint. Number one. Number two, you should use a palakos cement as a spacer because of its color. That when you take out the cements, it's easier to differentiate between a sclerosed bone and the cement, or else you add you know methylene blue so that uh, there is some kind of color cement is there and number 3 palakos cements elutes antibiotic in higher concentration compared to other cements that has been shown in the literature so that is the best cement to use as a spacer now the question is uh, rajiv uh, can you stop sharing the screen and uh, what are the disadvantages of uh, static spacer uh, can you just uh, Enumerate for benefit. The disadvantage of the static spacer will be the fibro the the fibrosis. The, this patient had an unstable joint uh, preoperative or or at the time of the first revision, stage one. But if the if there is no no instability at stage one, probably it's a better way to use a articulating spacer because uh, the second stage surgery, the revision second stage will become very easy. In a when you use a static spacer. The biggest problem is the stiffness and the exposure. Yeah, exposure. Second stage exposure becomes difficult in static spacer because the parapetal gutters are all fibrosed. You have to dissect, uh, you know, to a greater extent. Sometimes, you know, the patella uh, gets stuck to the anterior part of the femur, and uh, in the static spacer, it may get fused. So you have to be careful that there should be a layer of cement between anterior part of the femur and the patella, and. Uh, then uh, what is the disadvantage of a you know dynamic spacer, uh, Dr. Vosley, would you like to take that before I come to Vijay? Yeah, uh, one very important point of static spacer, there's a quadricep contracture. Now in this case also, he had to do osteotomy and uh, you can't depend on the soft tissue for stability. Maybe it is better to prefer a rotating hinge. That is one issue. Uh, now, disadvantage of the articular spacer, uh, one is if you use a cement hand molded, it should be very smooth. Otherwise, there are particular debris 
on movement it uh, accumulates and causes extra fibrous reaction which is uh, not very helpful second thing is sometimes there's a mechanical breakage on movement if the cement is uneven then it uh, known that it can break and uh, gives the extra instability to the joint third thing yeah. is if you use a metal processes with the poly uh, it has been shown that it has got a adhesive property for germs to get again biofilm earlier so these are three uh, disadvantages and uh, so those the soft, soft tissue sleeve is maintained and exposure becomes easier in a dynamic you know dynamic pressure or articulating pressure but there is a possibility of more bone loss when when the patient mobilizes the joint because of the cement yeah yeah vijay yeah the can i make a point yeah, yeah so the yeah. Um, uh, it was i mean uh, thought that uh, a outbreathing spacer will be better in terms of mobility and all that but uh, for example endocrinic they use only static spacers now yeah so the reason we found out why static spacers give stiffness is because of two things one you don't make the uh, maintain the collateral length and you don't do anything to the petrofemoral articulation rajiv showed excellent spacer but it's very important that somebody distracts the joint when you are measuring for the spacer and make sure that the spacer is the right uh, thickness that the collateral length is made that's the key step and then of course you put something in the between the petrola and the femoral surface and when these two are found it uh, you don't lose any range of movement at all yeah yeah uh, we just get that back in no time and uh, then now uh, you know the results of static spacer with many things are same as static as mobile spacers but athletic spacers are more expensive they have complications and they need a lot of experience to do that so uh, if you are a junior uh, you know it's best to go with a static spacer yeah well one more important point which uh, rajiv pointed out that while while the cement is setting you have to hold the soft tissue together otherwise there may be difficulty in closing your soft tissue sometimes you know when the cement sets and uh, you are not know there will be expansion and uh, you it will be difficult to close the you know soft tissues that was one disadvantage you know that was one point which one needs to remember there uh yeah one yeah. clear to bring you that when you we use the static spacer it should not be left in place for a very long time uh, in a period of 3 months 4 months you you must go is really difficult yeah this is just one monoblock spacer i'm showing this a patient in uh, primary total knee was done 1998 got infected in 2002 polyarticular rheumatoid and uh, from 2002 when the, there was a debridement was done patient collapsed on the table she was 72 years uh, old lady uh, uh, you know but afterwards uh, the, there was a recurrence of infection then uh, nobody attempted a surgery so 16 years old poly prosthetic joint infection when he presented me to me in 2017 this was a balloon knee polyarticular rheumatoid discharging sinus only yearly twice she was aspirated what our pass comes out fortunately she didn't go into any septicemia or bacteremia so when she presented with this dislocated osteoporotic knee and she was advised amputation for that knee what we did we took out the implants and prepared a static spacer like this uh, you know uh, rajiv you prepare with it uh, it were gone uh, you know syringe i prepare with it with a, you know you know 5 cc syringe i take two 5 cc syringe join them then prepare the cement cigars like this putting the cavers inside then cut those syringes and this cement cigars are out put one cement cigar inside the femur one cigar in the tibia then this cavers are projecting there and as vijay told that maintaining the you know soft tissue tension their collateral tension you fill it with the cement and hold it in that static position till the cement sets that is the post operative x ray of that patient and uh, as you can see your ap and lateral view so the wound everything healed uh, now at least is walking with a, you know with a rollator there and uh, polyarticular rheumatoid all the joints are deformed feet are deformed here special kind of shoes there this is just a 2 to 3 years follow up of this patient and she is mobilized with this and this is how we prepare articulating spacer this is ankylosing spondylitis this is we have made same polyselection templates 
this is on the femoral side we prepare a template like this and this is on the tibial side we prepare the template like this this of course is not available for uh, commercial use this is after putting the spacers inside this is how the x rays looks like then after this is of course second stage i'll just quickly and uh, show that is the you know four and a half years follow up this patient yeah any any other questions or Very we'll good. move right to the krishna's case any any question from the youtube krishna would you like to share your screen yeah asit yeah yes yeah. yeah asit your question okay yeah so just a comment so what vijay told is uh, you know the endoclinic which is doing maximum uh, infection work is preferring most of the cases the static spacer so yeah. do we think that role of a uh, mobile spacer is not so much now because we know we can get on with the second stage quite early in 2 3 months time and if we have followed the static spacer guidelines properly we should be able to do a second stage without much difficulty is that right so you know you know it depends uh, that uh, what is your uh, duration in between two stages first stage mm -hmm. and second stage that is not clearly defined in the literature that that is a surgeon's preference Correct. some people even uh, like in salvi hospital they put the static spacer after two weeks uh, they go ahead with the second stage really and uh, endoclinic may sometimes they go with the you know single stage revision mm. so if uh, the duration of your second stage is you know much longer or the patient is unreliable or will come very late Mm. then uh, you know static spacer will lead to a lot of uh, you know fibrosis of the tissues then exposure becomes difficult and subsequent uh, range of movement after second stage may be you know restricted so right. articulating spacer provides that thing that your range of movement will be much better you right. understand you uh, understand that one yeah. very important point i would like to share uh, endoclinic experience is exclusive i think what they do their ways radical debridement they remove all collateral and every case they use a rotating hinge and their rotating hinge is a hinge loaded it has no contact with the femur articular and tibia articular and their ways radical and they are successful they feel that collateral ligament when you remove the exposure everything becomes easy and debridement is perfect yeah good points uh, let's go ahead with the krishna's case yes please yeah thank you uh, thank you sir the uh, my case will highlight the role of intraarticular antibiotic <coughs> delivery just a second huh? i'm sorry about that so uh, my case will ro highlight the role of intraarticular antibiotic delivery for infected knee arthroplasty so direct infusion of intraarticular antibiotics has been used to salvage acute and chronic infected total knee arthroplasty and there are several references to this for example the vancomycin tissue distribution is 30% of the serum level so if we have 100% of serum level achieved then inside the joint the concentration is around 30% and for achieving an mic of 4 microgram per ml inside the joint serum concentration of almost 15 microgram per ml must be achieved and therefore comparing intravenous with intraarticular injection it suggested that minimal synovial fluid levels achieved from intravenous dosing would become subtherapeutic after 6 hours and we know our from our experience of these uh, uh, bacterial organisms that you need to have a sustained uh, supra therapeutic elevated levels inside the synovial fluid in order to get uh, good infection control and lot of the iv doses are uh, not able to achieve this sustained control and this contributes to the development of small colony forming units and resistant biofilm formation and resistance of uh, antibiotics happens because there is a waxing and waning of the intrasynovial levels of the antibiotic following uh, intravenous administration of the antibiotics so this uh, case is a 54 year old lady who presented to us with pain and multiple discharging sinuses over the right knee her esr was 120 and crp was 80 at presentation she had no comorbidities the patient had an infected right knee uh, replacement the index procedure was 18 months back a debridement with implant retention was done 15 months back 
and the persistent infection led, led to a two stage revision uh, which was done around 9 9 months back and pseudomonas was grown in the culture at the time of the second stage uh, revision and this is her x ray uh, right now with multiple discharging cyanosis and uh, you can see that the femoral component is loose and migrated laterally and you can see some bone formation there so uh, if you look at the options for her we, because she is young less comorbidities the options could be repeat two stage revision or arthrodesis and if you look at the literature actually arthrodesis is strongly considered after failed two stage reimplantation in tka and uh, the two stage exchange has got a failure rate ranging from 11 to 24% reinfection and dr j parvezi uh, talked about this 25% failure at two years and we must uh, look at this in perspective because lot of the reinfections happen between 6 months and 18 months after the thing and in some papers reinfection rate is as high as 40% so uh, that must be kept in mind so is there a role of local antibiotic delivery uh, this paper from leo whiteside who described the technique uh, had good results with mrsa managed with one stage cementless revision with intraarticular vancomycin through hickman catheter so he used two hickman catheters inside the joint and gave injection for 6 weeks no iv antibiotics were given beyond 24 uh, hours so there are several uh, conceptual advantages to uh, local delivery of antibiotics there is prevention of antibiotic resistance because you are maintaining a supra therapeutic levels of antibiotic inside the joint and we are not looking at a minimum inhibitory concentration anymore not mic we are looking at a biofilm inhibitory concentration which is now a reality with local antibiotic delivery you can make sure that there is antibiotic level inside the joint around the clock and you can prevent systemic side effects because now you don't need to give as much duration of antibiotics and a point here is that all of us have got almost 100 trillion bacteria inside us which is called as a microbiome and the microbiome role in uh, the longevity of human beings is increasingly being studied and if you just give an antibiotic for three or four doses more than 50 to 60 bacterial species will get irreversibly damaged in a infected situation when we are giving 6 weeks of antibiotics no wonder the mortality for uh, these patients is higher because they are damaging lot of the normal uh, gut flora and uh, the local antibiotic delivery definitely must be looked at in the future uh, the other uh, option again has been published by leo white said on the technique as to how this particular technique is used and they did a synovial fluid measurement also serum measurement following intraarticular delivery and they had 95% success rate in managing two difficult categories of patients the mrsa and failed two stage revision with intraarticular infusion of antibiotics at our institute it's a, a normal practice to use intraarticular antibiotics and minimize the use of intravenous antibiotics in our patients and we've been doing it for the past 10 years so this patient underwent a stage 1 revision with a, 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 an antibiotic spacer and the local antibiotic delivery of colistin was given in this case uh, with 3 million units once daily for 2 weeks and we know that colistin is a very uh, you know um, toxic antibiotic can cause nephrotoxicity so if you have uh, uh, multi drug resistant pseudomonas or gram negative bacteria good option to give colistin 3 million units once daily for 2 weeks through the pigtail catheter and uh, uh, the culture grew pseudomonas and klebsiella we are finding more often nowadays gram negative infection polymicrobial infections in our uh, patients we gave iv antibiotics for 2 weeks it's important to give for 5 to 7 days at least because you want to have uh, uh, some level of mic to be achieved uh, in the serum before the local delivery takes over and all patients are given probiotics which is an often uh, overlooked feature in these uh, patients you must give them bifidobacter and lactobacillus species in order to minimize the level of microbiome damage which happens in these patients and that's the pigtail catheter which we routinely use and we were not happy with the uh, initial spacer because there were no uh, no intramedullary extension it was an error which i uh, made and so i repeated the spacer exchange after 6 weeks because the uh, multiply operated and failed uh, uh, revision scenario and now after the 6 weeks after the second spacer the knee aspirate was negative the esr and sedrates uh, crp uh, settled wounds were well healed and we planned a revision uh, totally arthroplasty with metaphyseal sleeves to manage the bone loss and we used a hybrid fixation we used uh, cemented on the surface and uncemented inside the medullary canal the advantages are there for both cemented and uncemented fixation 
The cemented has option of local antibiotics and uncemented may be easier to remove in cases of reinfection which happens early. And that's the uh, one year uh, follow up of the patient. You can see the multiple heel sinuses on the uh, leg. One on the medial side, one on the inferolateral side, one on the superior side. But she had a reasonable uh, functional outcome. So to conclude, intraarticular infusion of colistin is an option in salvage of failed two-stage gram-negative infection. It is also our choice in patients with MRSA, where we are doing a two-stage revision. So you give intraarticular 500 milligrams of vancomycin, and it's a it's an option which is often overlooked but must be considered in my view. Thank you. Thanks, Krishna. Great. Yeah, very good. Very good, Krishna. Good yeah. Yes. Okay. Can you just uh, elaborate a little bit on the procedure? On the catheter. That, uh, catheter yeah, also how, very important. Yeah. How, yeah so, what so catheter the, you take and how much uh, antibiotic, how the, the entire procedure just a uh, little bit for the... Very uh, interesting. For all of us. So the uh, the original technique by Leo Weitzel looked at swan Gans catheter, which is used for CVP lines. Uh, the swan Gans catheter is reasonably expensive and the original technique describes two catheters which are inserted into the joint. And he combines it with a one-stage cementless revisions. Uh, the reason being, his antibiotic profile is for six weeks. He doesn't give it for two weeks as we do. He gives it for six weeks. And there is a sinus formation around that catheter because it's made of silicon. And that requires excision. So what we found is that if you use a pigtail catheter, which is a urologic catheter, which is used for uh, uh, draining a pleural effusion or an empyema, and it has been used to inject antibiotics into the pleural space, so you use a 10 gauge uh, pigtail catheter, it's very cheap and available and you insert it in the joint and use it for two weeks, at most three weeks. Then the risk of sinus formation is almost not there and you can just pull it out. And we've had a reasonably good outcome in almost 67 to 70 patients where we have done one stage revision and two stage revision and it is our protocol of choice currently. So we don't do any infected case, whether it's trauma or arthroplasty without using a, a pigtail catheter. So we insert it use stitches to anchor it and then train the patient to uh, give the injection in a particular way in the ward when the patient is admitted and at the time of suture removal it is removed and we've not had problems with sinus formation or issues with the catheter itself uh, we do don't give have, IV have another catheter and uh, just suck it out after a couple of um, contact time of certain uh, period like that you, only you, one catheter the dose of antibiotic is much lesser as compared to what you give for a normal, you know, if you want to give an IV antibiotic and you want to achieve MIC, the uh, level of antibiotic which you have to give is much higher. For an intra-articular use, the concentration inside the joint is 750 times. So that has been studied as compared to what it happens in the serum level. So there is no question of that antibiotic dipping down below the level of MIC which is required. So that's why I talked about the concept of biofilm inhibiting concentration. So it's a BIC. It's not MIC anymore. It's BIC. So your intra-articular concentration is maintained throughout the day. Single dose is enough. And uh, is we, don't, we, we don't have the facility, but Leo Whiteside has actually tested the serum concentration and he has come up with that particular figure. He said 500 milligram of vancomycin is good enough per day. Single dose of 500 milligram is good enough to prevent uh, toxic serum levels while maintaining good therapeutic concentrations inside the joint itself. So it has worked well in our hands. Uh, I am not sure why it's not included in any of the thing because apart from Leo White said nobody talks about this. Yeah, very interesting. I think. Uh, yeah. Yeah, now, so Asit, Asit followed by Vijay. Yeah. yeah. Now Leo White said was here in 2017 in Calcutta, IA, and one of the subsequent I mean previous meeting also. I spoke to him. Why? No, he is a very good teacher and he has done this. No one, even in US, Northern America follows this particular uh, way of treating the local antibiotic delivery system. It appears very, very appealing. And as Krishna has uh, you know, shown us that, you know, it really is effective and reduces IV dose. My question to Krishna is, if your antibiotic uh, sensitivity and the microorganism that you get from the first stage of the uh, first stage of revision, would it change your antibiotic? Because you mentioned about cholestin, he mentioned about vancomycin. So what yeah. would be your antibiotic so choice? So cholestin is now, uh, cholestin will definitely do an intra-articular thing because it's a toxic antibiotic. But if it's a gram-positive organism, we've been using vancomycin. So we will use vancomycin. Uh, there is literature evidence for gentamicin and amikacin intra-articular and they've measured the concentrations and the therapeutic concentrations are there. Cholestin, there is no evidence uh, as such, but there is 
evidence of use of cholestin inside the polymethyl methacrylate spacer so uh, the paper which has looked at the role of primary uh, uh, antibiotic laden cement in primary joint replacement looked at gentamicin and cholestin impregnated bone cement versus no uh, antibiotic bone cement so cholestin theoretically is heat stable can be in, used inside the joint can have some sort of percolation so we've been using cholestin you know, only in the gram negative multi drug resistant organisms so we're using that because we had problems with the uh, iv use of the particular uh, drug but other patients where there is gram positive or culture negative so 35% i must admit in our center are culture negative 65% we are able to uh, get the organism and only 40% we are able to identify before the uh, intervention so if we even if i do a one stage revision i am able to identify organism only 40% of the times intraoperative culture will give me another 25% success rate but 35% of them still we can't grow any bug despite all the effort correct we put in a blood culture medium we put it in the thing that is a fact for my my own practice and very, whenever very i don't grow grow any uh, bug i still give vancomycin for 3 weeks that is my uh, own practice protocol yeah yeah bj yeah we have experience with it the reason why is not popular is uh, you know most of those guys deal with gram positive infections i mean you have a cement spacer inside with vanco there's no need for any internal catheter it does its purpose yeah so the catheter is meant for cases where you don't get uh, proper antibiotic delivery with cement uh, spacer now uh, uh, the cholestin is the classical example where we use uh, gram negative not for the initial period of uh, that we use in the cement so we cover the initial phase but prolonged there's no oral antibiotic and you give them a shot of cholestin their kidney packs up uh, and that's when this really comes into its play and then you are able to think but the real uh, practical difficulty is it is that if you extend it so uh, assume that the antibiotic delivery for the cement is for 2 weeks or less where you want is to act is beyond that time but you cannot maintain the catheter beyond that time you know so you you are parallel with the cement and that's why we are not very enthusiastic we are very enthusiastic one point in time but we uh, we are we cannot maintain it for 6 weeks for example doesn't work that way yeah. so it's a uh, you know practical problem that we have but the cement does the same job if we are able to get a good uh, sensitivity put the uh, itq antibiotic in the cement it does the same job that's why it is not get got popular the reason why it no uses it is because it does one stage non cemented pkr revisions he has no other choice and we don't do that and that's where uh, he alone used it and nobody else used it that's why thirst and Yeah, everybody are against this concept. Uh, how many of uh, of you use uh, this uh, local antibiotic delivery through stimulant or calcium sulfate cement uh, granules? Yeah, it's I it's, think very useful. We now use it uh, routinely, but that I think is a very recent concept. Maybe last two years we are all using it, but uh, Leo White said described this uh, uh, 15 years ago. So I don't know. So yeah, a little, yeah. you know, things move on. So now yeah, there are that one also. Oh. there are different methods of uh, local antibiotic delivery this is uh, you know catheter through catheter through stimulant or through collagen fleece some sponges there are so many things have been described in the literature but as bj told you know maximum antibiotic delivery is 2 to 4 weeks either from the cement or from you know catheter or whatever that is the maximum you know time of antibiotic delivery so oh, what uh, you know what we have not discussed properly what are the antibodies can be added to the cement and how much antibody should be added to the cement one by one uh, we start with krishna yeah you can use an, any heat stable antibiotics it has to be heat stable and 10% weight by volume so if it's uh, doesn't exceed 10% that should be all right otherwise the cement will denature but if you are using it in an articulating uh, in a static spacer you can increase the dose maybe to 20% because it's not going to be a, a sort of a, uh, a long term solu- uh, solution for you anyway but if you are doing a one stage revision or using the autoclave the implant or a new implant in a one stage manner 10% probably is upper limit yeah you know the international consensus group recommend 5% volume by volume of the cement for the final fixation of the prosthesis if you are using as a spacer yeah you can use more because that makes cement more porous and that elutes antibiotic in a higher concentration when you are using a cement spacer the bj what are the antibiotics name name for some antibiotics that should never be added to the cement should not be added to the cement 
Um, I'm not sure about that super show. Yeah. So Banco, Tobra, Genta, Colison, no. we had. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know about the what should not be used. I'm not sure. Yeah, you know this uh, macrolide antibiotics that should not be added. Penicillin should not be added. Repumpation should not be added because repumpation in the cement doesn't harden for days together. So these are the antibiotics should never be added to the cement. As vegetable bancomycin, cephalosporins can be added. You know, you can add ticoplanin, all these things, antibiotics uh, can be added. Quinolones, quinolones can be added. I don't think quinolones can be added. No, quinolones, so we don't add it. Quinolones cannot be added. This, um, uh, you know, best antibiotics are amino glycosides, but the problem is yeah. that in our country, amino glycosides are available in liquid form. They do not recommend adding liquid antibiotics to the cement. Uh, it should be in powder form. But abroad, you know, tobramycin and all it's available in the liquid form. That's why we use uh, the pre-mixed antibiotics which are available in the market, like gentamycin or tobramycin impregnated cement. Yeah, Rajiv, anything you would like to add? Um, I use the uh, vancomycin and tobramycin in all cases. And you are right that tobramycin, all these uh, antibiotics are available in the liquid form. So it it, it but, but the ideal uh, amount of tobromycin is about 3.6 gram in a pack of cement, which is not possible when we are using a liquid form. Yeah, so I, I think that that's a little disadvantage for us. Yeah, but but if you use the vancomycin, you use about three gram of vancomycin per pack of cement. But you get pre-mixed tobra, yeah. That's what we use. Yeah. yeah. Well, what we used, all the amino glycosides are pre-mixed. Right. Because you can't add this liquid antibodies that grossly alters the, you know, cement uh, properties. Well, what are the antibodies you add to stimulant? Sir, like a... St Hello? Yeah. Yes? Uh, stimulant, yeah, they give the composite to mix up with... Uh, 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 vancomycin, but we instead of that we have uh, used gentamycin to mix the uh, stimulants along with the vancomycin, so that with the limited uh, supply you get a dual antibiotic course in stimulants. And coming to the cement, uh, we had a couple of cases where the TB was proven, and uh, well, if I, we are planning for rifampicin, we are like made sure that we will spend extra 20 minutes for the cement to set. The color will be changed orange color, and it will take another uh, 15 minutes to settle. But uh, ID people feel it is like uh, it's a suggestion because the endoclinic they have an IV rifampicin, so they are like much more aggressive. We don't have the IV here, so we preferred uh, using rifampicin in uh, cement along with it. In in tuberculosis, we add streptomycin. Streptomycin and the amino glycoside, the powder is very much available. So in okay, tuberculosis, yeah. we add streptomycin. Mm -hmm. Rifampicin okay. injectable form is not available in our country. Uh, yeah. You know, it's not uh, recommended by uh, FDA India, but uh, you know, repumpation tablet to available that's not available mm -hmm. for stimulant. When you add, we have added, you know, gentamicin and liquid antibiotics to stimulant, but please remember when you add gentamicin, then uh, you should not add the liquid which is provided by the stimulant, mm -hmm. you yeah. add just, uh, just the gentamicin because if you add the liquid, you know, along with gentamicin liquid, then the stimulant doesn't set, it takes very, very long time. Then you are held up on the table. So in stimulant, it is not a very, you know, exothermic reaction. So you can add uh, other antibiotics. They have got certain recommendations. But one thing to remember that when you are adding gentamicin, like liquid antibiotics, please do not add the liquid which is provided by the company. Yeah, I think uh, we have discussed uh, everything. We have covered any other questions, Abhinav, or else we can wind up. Sure, Shubranshu, before we close, uh, in, a, in a case of the periprostatic joint infection, we must talk about the, at, at least mention the name of arthrodesis and the yeah. implants for arthrodesis, the newer implant for arthrodesis. Yeah. So that, that is also one of the uh, in, in cases where you have an intractable infection, failed revisions for infection, the arthrodesis remains the last choice. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And and you have certain implants available these days, which you have a, um, which will work as a arthrodesis device. Yeah, thank you. Uh, now before we wind up, uh, I'll just uh, go ahead with the uh, for our uh, next webinar. Uh, we now give little bit of rest because the we are going out of the lockdown. So we'll have our next webinar on 20th of June, 2020. That is a Saturday. 
and uh, we'll have a webinar on total knee orthoplasty for knee arthritis with extra articular deformity and dr rajiv sharma is going to moderate that session and our guest faculty will be again professor jean louis brad from france i thank you all for attending i thank all the faculty for being here and uh, have a stay uh, stay safe stay home and uh, now we brace for our openings uh, uh, for the you know for our work uh, now now i stop sharing the screen and uh, i close the session thank, thank you, you very much Thank you very much. Yes, Should I stop the live stream? Yeah, please. Yeah, well done, well done, Subhan Shukla. Great, 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 very, great. Well. very nice. nice, excellent. It is more than three hours now. Yes, <laughs> we record most of the things. You know, it is important. Infection is very, very important. And you know, mega, uh, mega session. I think we covered almost everything. Correct. And this and, and Jawad and Austin were very useful. And our problem is different because we have setups right from corporate setups to a small nursing home. and uh, people doing joint arthroplasty i mean joint replacement surgery everywhere you know from a smaller nursing home to big city big corporate hospitals so we probably have to have this kind of uh, you know infection should be a major issue which was very yeah, well many, covered today many, many times aaj uh, you know what thurston uh, told we should have dedicated centers for uh, you know treating uh, infected joints problem is that everybody is also you know in every small center they want to do revision yeah, you know correct. put special everything and uh, just bombard with antibiotics people become resistant and all this that becomes a issue for us yes absolutely you know at our place even a gp prescribes antibiotics to the patient who's had a joint uh, infection when we tell them that you need a revision first thing he'll do is he'll go to a gp who probably will prescribe uh, some antibiotics so we are against that so we have those kind of issues which they don't face so i think so this kind of center development will be a much more difficult here in our set up right. it will be impossible yeah impossible <laughs> centers yeah and and we have to have a infectious disease and microbiologist proper microbiologist to recommend the combination of antibiotics what antibiotics uh, should be used you know you uh, you have a discussion it's a team effort correct but our orthopedic surgeon they don't only decide about the antibiotics what antibiotics to be given correct correct i think so it's important to have that Uh, coordination with the microbiologist and the IT specialist because these are going to go on for a very long time. Patients become medically ill after taking these IV antibiotics, and then you know, then we are stuck at that point that you know what to medically do. The so if we are IT specialist and a physician looking after, that will be much better. So it's like a team approach, rightly said. Yeah, Shubhranchu, we must uh, talk about the Indian Arthroplasty Association uh, antibiotic policy. Uh, we must yeah. come out with that document. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That will be very useful. Yeah, Krishna will be happy to help uh, Bali yeah. with the you know newsletter. I think is taking a little longer time. Yeah. And uh, see, see, we have all the you know articles ready. Your article ready, Doctor. Uh, you know, or um, Bharat Bharat Bhai's Bharat article is ready. Or uh, Rajiv's article is ready. So let's uh, go ahead and uh, take out it. Take it out here first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another article on the bilateral knee or the single knee. the indications for bilateral that uh, anup was supposed